Welcome back, guys, to the Bear and Scully podcast with me, Sean Scullion, a.k.a. Scully, Old Man, a.k.a. The Bear, in the face for radio behind the scenes, and today we're joined with Laura McNeely. Hi, yeah. Uh, welcome thank to the show. Laura, thank you very much for show. having me. Before I get into interrogating you, Sean's a wee bit rusty there. Do you see the, see the colour of this man? He's been away there for... What you want uh, to say? He's been away on holiday. <laughs> just, to, just to, your intro wasn't your usual. You were thinking it through there. I could tell, you know, he's been rusty. He's off a week there. It's not a... that I'm thinking it through because I'm rusty. I'm thinking it through because we've changed this board. <laughs> yes, your name's now on it. <laughs> That's we, it. We are, Big deal. We are. I, I, it's cool too. But, Laura, Very enough. It's, we always make this about us, Sean. That's always not about us. Anyway, <laughs> no, it's a wee bit about Sean, but on his tan. But anyway, <laughs> and he worked hard for that tan. Look at that there. Factor 50. Oh, Oh, Factor 50. Laura, thank you very much for coming on. Um, thank you. It's not something that you want to be here saying. It's not a conversation we want to have, but this is the thing about the podcast. This is exactly mm-hmm. what we're here to do. Yeah. We're here to give a platform to people to speak where other platforms won't because yes. they're worried about things. Yeah. Uh, before we get into it, it is important that it's important, maybe legally, I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm saying this here, it what you're telling us now, we haven't researched it for that. This is the opinions yeah. that you've given to us. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, we will ask you questions um, mm-hmm. from our point of view. But um, before we get all into the serious side of things, and we may need just in this here, we'll probably get and put a disclaimer in here. Yes. Um, the disclaimer, we're going to speak about child sexual abuse, mm-hmm. manipulation, grooming, yep. people with things, so we, will put, so we will be putting that in, um, mm-hmm. and we'll sort that out at the end. But before we get into that, Laura, um, what about a wee bit of a brief background on who you are and where you're from? And so, Laura McNeely, I'm from Macrofeld, born and bred. Macrofeld. Um, Macrofeld, <laughs> big, big time. And I live at home with my husband, Dee, and my daughter, who has also autism and ADHD, which I feel is an important um, aspect to, to throw into the mix of, of everything as well. But it just, um, yeah, there's there's um, a lot of aspects to cover. What age that. is your daughter now? She will be 11 now in October coming, so can well, I 11 ask, in two months now. Can I ask you this question? And I just, I don't, I, I, want, I don't know what this really, if this is right, the way to say this, but... What what what's it like with autism and ADHD? Oh, a mad box of frogs, but it is. I because uh, I, 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 I this might seem bad. I sort of just got this impression. I was like, shit. Both. <laughs> that could be hard work, you know. Yeah. And, I, and I don't mean this. Uh, maybe sometimes I say it. I'm I'm just thinking that, and I don't mm-hmm. mean that in a bad way. No. But I mean it's hard enough. Um, if your your child's autistic, maybe they, mm-hmm. they require certain children different scale. But yeah. I mean. They require more, more one to one or more yes. thought on on what you're doing. Definitely. But add ADHD into the middle mm-hmm. of it. Yeah. So I knew from very early on when um, probably when she was maybe about six, six to eight months, roughly about that, that there was just we traits we um she was fascinated by lights um always on the go. I mean she would have kicked that play mat until the bitter end like um food her bottles um that had to be cold she would she didn't like the hot um then when it come to weaning again food everything had to be so bland and separate like even at the weaning stage she if i had to put out mashed potato and say carrots and those were mixed with a wee bit of gravy no nope, it's bad out but if we went for mashed potato and the carrots separate and the gravy separate to dip into it ah oh, loved life um, then hitting school, we went to, whenever she went into nursery school, they, uh, they approached me and said, look, they had like a wee music room, um, where they went into it nursery and they would have done like wee songs and tambourines and, you know, all, all the wee, the wee music sets. And she would have sat with her hands over her ears, um, didn't like the hand dryers, didn't want to mix. She would have sat, you know, and like rocking and stimming and different wee things and they actually approached me and said Laura we think there's something wrong with her hearing and I thought no that can't be right because that child would hear the freaking grass growing um 
But to follow procedures and skill and once they, they make, you know, something aware, you follow through with it. So we did. We took her and um, they made the referral. We took her up and we got her hearing test. And Jesus Christ, better than mine. <laughs> you know, there's absolutely nothing wrong with her hearing. It was spot spot on. Then um, primary school came and she went in, but she was a very... The, the, the teachers all described her as a social butterfly. She never stayed with the one person. You know, even when it come to story time, she was watching out the window. Maybe the man was cutting the grass or she would have counted the leaves in the tree. Or, But she would have come home that evening and told me word for word that story. Um, Her memory is fantastic. Um, But found it very hard to mix with peers of her own age, with her own age group. She either would have went to the youngest or the baby or the adult. Um, she And if she was playing with someone her own age, it, it was one on one. It couldn't be three, four kids all playing in a group. She just, she just couldn't process that. She couldn't. It had to be one on one, and that was it. Um, and home life. Oh my goodness, sleep. Sleep has been <laughs> the bane of our lives, and that child can easily run to this day. And even now, she's on medication for both autism and ADHD. So she takes medication at night for to help her sleep, and during the day for her ADHD. But I mean, three hours sleep, that's her. I two two hours sleep? Two hours sleep. Two hours sleep in a night? Maybe three if you're lucky. It's about so, a bit tight. Yep. That, that, the sleep deprivation is well known as one of the key tortures. Oh, here? It's a serious form of torture. I can but but I mean, it's actually used as torture. Mm-hmm. In, in yeah. Con- so, like, f- can I ask you this here? Mm-hmm. A friend of mine told me, the drug that they had, the drug for the, to try and help the child sleep. Melatonin. You can be giving them that, but it's still not mm-hmm. taking any effect. Like. No. And as a baby, you know, she would have slept during the day. But see, the minute, maybe half nine, ten o'clock, you could have put the clock on anywhere between half nine and sort of eleven at night. Ping, rabbit in the headlights. That's me. I'm up, ready to go. No matter how much we tried to... Keep her awake during the day. No, we tried everything. We baby massage. We tried interactions. Everything. No, nothing. And as the years went on, and then you go through the toddler stage, and then you're into, you know, like your preschool and and primary school. I was putting. I I remember sitting at the top of the stairs one night, and I think it was easy 30, 30 odd times. I kept putting her back into her bedroom. I was like, can you please just go to sleep? Please go to sleep. And I mean, I was sitting and I was crying. My husband, like the two of us, just it was like shift work. Try and you know, both of well, us. That's what I was going to ask. Did you just take shifts out? Yeah. Because for self preservation, you couldn't have just. You no, and the both of us just passed each other like a ship on the night because if he was on duty, as we called it, I was trying to get some rest to then deal with her during the day and, and all her wee, her wee antics, you know, like, and you couldn't have took your eyes off for two minutes. Not two minutes. Like there was one day in particular, <laughs> she had, um, I can't even remember what it was she'd done. But I had said to her, right, into the living room, don't come out of that room until I get the dishes done. Just please sit there, play. I will be literally five minutes. I'm going to get the dishes done. And five minutes had passed, uh, not even five minutes actually, and I thought, Jesus, something's wrong, because she's normally out of, that, out of that room in 30 seconds, doesn't give a damn. And uh, she was writing what she was saying, so that that's where the autism comes in, like the told not to do something. And to be fair to her, she didn't, she wasn't, she didn't leave the living room through the door that I told her, I said, don't cross the door, don't come out of the living room. She went out the window, and there she was, Jesus. across the field, playing with kids, and here's me. Huh? Said, well played. Yeah. Well played. You can't go out the door, you can go out the window. Yeah. And I said, so I opened up the front door, and I'm shouting at her, get over here now. And you, I told you not to leave that living room, I told you not to cross that door, but mummy, I didn't go out the door. I said, oh my God, I had to give it to her, like, I was like, fair play, kid. <laughs> you know? but, well, is it very much sensory then, your, yeah. your daughter, I? Yeah, so um, fireworks, sound, smells, food, taste, every sensory. Mm-hmm. Um, and then with the ADHD, she's just like I just explain her like a wee mad box of frogs. She's just the most lovable, comical, mad child, you know. But there's she doesn't know, she doesn't know to be bad, you know. She doesn't, and I think that that's what came from being bullied in school as well, because she was the wee social butterfly and. Um, you know, she has like a wee birthmark on her arm and they would have made fun of her. And then the next day she would have come back into school and maybe the one that that had 
said something nasty to her the day before or fell out with her or went to the teacher or left her coming home upset for some reason. They were saying, you know, do you want to come play with me? Yeah. And she was straight away back playing with her again. And then maybe they'd done it to her again. So she d- she didn't understand. She just thinks everybody's her friend and just wants to go and play and, you know, just trust everyone. And yeah, she's... There is a fortunate side there because a lot of autism children can't have any social interaction. Yes. Where they don't want to, they, they can't mm-hmm. look you in the eye, they can't mm-hmm. talk, they're non-verbal. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there, but then it exposes that vulnerability where she's not, she doesn't fully aware of mm-hmm. of that, and children are cruel. Yeah, well, now she didn't speak until no, like your your mamas and your dadas and your wee goos and gas. She, we didn't have any of that until she was about two and a half, um, and that again was another reason in my head. God, there's something here, you but know. Can I ask? You had said that the primary school had come to you and said about the hair. Mm-hmm. Were you the nursery school. Oh, the nursery, sorry. So yeah. she was about three, three and a half at this yeah. point. So you were, the, some of these traits and some of the things, the likes of the talk and all, you were mm-hmm. starting to become aware. And, and we're all very sensitive to this now. Yes. Of a child, you're like, you're watching and you're you're mm-hmm. worrying and you're, you're, you know, you want to make sure that they're fine. And was there a part of you that was aware of, of this, but not fully ready to make sure you know, get someone or definition. And and the reason I'm asking this is we had a guest on previously. It hasn't been released, so you wouldn't have been aware of it yet, but it will be next week. Um, They were talking, they, it was on autism. Mm-hmm. And this woman had become aware of very thing, and she had fought and argued to get a diagnosis. Mm-hmm. Well, the child was 18 months, wasn't mm-hmm. it? And the arg- mm-hmm. Not the argument that I had, but the question I had for her was, Questioning these behaviours early on, some of the things you described there was very, very clear mm-hmm. autistic cues. Yeah. But some of it's just some children don't don't start talking or some children yeah. don't like to wean and mm-hmm. you know, was there a part of you knew but oh, yeah. weren't weren't there or when the school come to you you're like no or I think or just no. not fully aware of it maybe or or what it was? No, I always, as I said, like from she was about 68 months, I knew that there was something. Um, but again, maybe put it down to first time mother, I didn't know what. Um, and I and I always say, it's people always say, you know, well, it's not that people always say, some people say autism, that there's something wrong. There's nothing wrong with an autistic child. They're just, their wee brains are just wired different. You know, they just process things differently to someone that isn't on the spectrum. But um, from her about 68 months as I say I knew and then going in and hearing that teacher come and saying to me we think there's a problem with her hearing I knew in my heart that there wasn't a problem with her hearing as I say like she could hear the grass growing with her sitting there and with her describing to me with her hands on her ears and like if I had went into public toilets and used a hand dryer after oh she had a meltdown hated it so I knew there was a sensory processing yeah. thing there with her and I was the parent that did fight for a diagnosis for her. Not not as early as nursery school now, because, you know, you always want to, I suppose, give the, give the child that extra extra chance. In my, my circumstance now, because she, at this stage, wasn't nonverbal, you know, her speech and everything had came on and, you know, like her, you know, like her um, ability to write and colour in and, you know, all those wee things were, was all lining up. It was literally her sensory and her hyperactivity and the not sleeping so it was primary school when I decided right and I was going into parent teacher meetings you know P1 and P2 was the biggie P1 sort of yeah their kids and they're this is all new to them and they've left mummy and daddy and they're, they're maybe going to wreck the place for a while and, and just be kids you understand that but then coming into P2 you know they should be starting to settle down and making their wee friends and fighting their feet and no, she just wasn't. She was still showing the same traits. So I had said to the teacher then at the parent teacher inter- inter- interview, uh, sorry, the teacher actually said to me in the P2 interview, but I knew it was coming. I wanted her to say to me um, about the wee social butterfly and we think she was doing in the classroom and she had said, look, I have taught children obviously for years or whatever and she notices autistic traits w- within her. And I says, I am so glad that you have said that because... It backs up, I suppose, my 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 views on it and, and what I see and what we see at home. It's not just that it's in home, it's obviously school as well and that's just, just how it is. So from there we got the referral and, and we started the, proje- the process 
And yeah, we got initially the autism diagnosis first. And she started her melatonin along with um, extra support um, through phone calls and ver- various different, th- um, uh, what, what's the word for them? Various different, um, not counsellors, but uh, through, through the autism awareness site, you know, like guiding us and oh, yes, putting yes. in like wee visuals yep. and routines and things like that. Because routine is a, is a massive mm-hmm. one with her. Um, Advisors, no? Uh-huh. Was there people advising you that on Yes. Yeah. Well, th- just before we go there, how long did that process take? Oh gosh. From the referral till to the diagnosis. Um, that would have been two and a half, almost three years. And what what see the the process of going uh, in there? Mm-hmm. What way do they? Do they observe her? Do they? What way? What is their yeah. process of the diagnosis? Uh, there's a different task they set out, you know. What, and the reason I'm asking this is because we we have asked this before, and I'm mm-hmm. still not very clear on 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 it. Mm-hmm. And I was that's why I wanted to think: to, is it like a pro, is it a few times you go to them? Is it a doctor? Yeah. Is it a, a well for consultant? us? For us, yeah, it was a few times. So because the school then had put the referral in. Um, instead of just coming from the parents, I think I've heard of other parents putting in like a self-referral and they're not really taken seriously, you know, unless they're in school and maybe the teacher's backing it up and seeing it again, that different home to school life side and, and how the child is reacting. But yes, initially, once that referral in, now it did, it took quite a few months until we got the first appointment and we had one down and it was a lady doctor or consultant went in and she brought us in and went through just various bits of paperwork. And then she had taken her in and she had like puzzles and um, like a wee map and different different wee activities just to see how she reacted. to it. And my child actually went in and she had asked her to do the, she said, like, you know, all the pieces mixed up on the table of the puzzle. And she turned the pieces around so the picture was facing down the table. So we, the, the, the jigsaw pieces were blank and she built that blank without seeing the picture and didn't know what the picture was. She just put those pieces together. I think there was like, was there 12 pieces in the puzzle or something? And she was six at that stage and she was fit to build that puzzle upside down. And they did, they, it's, it's hard for us, but they do not see things the no. way we do. We use the Completely picture. Completely different. We use the picture to work out the the puzzle mm-hmm. where they work out which fits with which. What, yep. Mm-hmm. And it's a, it's a funny process because I reckon some of the most gifted magician or mathematicians and in, in had mm-hmm. Asperger's and levels of autism because they use different parts of the brain. Mm-hmm. So they have and a numbers are her thing. Yeah, always has been. See time, like even now she'll say, "Mommy, what time is it?" And I'll say, oh, "Quarter past one." No, it's thirteen sixteen. Christ, <laughs> one minute like, but that yeah. one minute is crucial on her yeah. head. You know, like even in school, maths in the brain loves sums, loves. Anything to do with numbers, letters, forget about it. No, give her numbers, give her something to work out, give her a task like like that puzzle, something physical that she has to work her wee brain to, to do, you know. And she doesn't need to see the box or the picture. She just knows by that puzzle. And as I say, with the picture facing down, so the blank, the blank side, and she will build that. Like. It must be hard for a teacher. They're fully aware and they see lots of different children and... Mm-hmm. They, you know, everyone knows their own child. Nobody will know your child ever better than you'll know. Yeah. But you only know your child. Where a teacher has a class of 30 and maybe one child is seeing things different, working them out different. So yep. they, they maybe become more aware of it quicker in the, in the fact that, <coughs> you know, me. they're they're watching the full pattern of, mm-hmm. of what normal behavior. And I'm not saying normal yeah. behavior, but do you know what I mean? And children yeah. that aren't on the spectrum... How they go about their how tasks they present differently. and how how children on the spectrum do, but that's one thing becoming aware that the child may have autistic traits. Mm-hmm. The other is breaching it to the parents. Yeah, that can't be easy. And my husband was dead. Not not against it, but he was like, "No, there's nothing wrong." I said, "I never said there was something wrong. No one is saying that there is anything wrong. We just need to figure out, you know." The diagnosis, wait till we get that and figure out how we can best support her, what's going to work best for her, how we can support her through school, what 
what the school can put in place then to you know to help her whether it be reasonable adjustments you know let her bring in a wee fidget in her in her hand or something sensory you know so she's aggravated or she's feeling a wee bit um uh, emotional or, or anything in school she has that wee rubby in her pocket that she can go right 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 it's okay i've got something you know um but again yes my husband and i remember the day that we got her diagnosis we were in the house and she was in school and the phone rang so my husband had then so yes they that was the the day she built the puzzle this was after this another appointment they she had to go to a center in Ballymena cottage can't remember the name of it it's in Ballymena anyway and she went down and they had all the kids in like a classroom setting nearly but they had two people per child you know observing one in the room one outside and making notes and that's I don't know my husband took her that day so I don't know the full really ins and outs of it but but two weeks later they rang me with the diagnosis and says yes Laura you know she has autism we we're now putting it down we'll send you out the paperwork and then the background I remember I was in front of my husband I I had it on speaker you know so he could hear as well and he just shouted bullshit I said fuck this is now going to be a conflict between me and him because where I have accepted it and he's clearly finding it harder to accept he's thinking more in the lines of they're saying there's something wrong with my child and going you know there's nothing wrong with my child we just need to work out how we can best move forward to support her in her wee head and in her wee world to make things as easy as possible and now he is he could tell you the ins and outs of autism and ADHD I think that's Absolutely I think that's I think that's a man thing mm-hmm. uh, and I think we're very and close daddy's and wee princess and wee girl you know I think cubs you know mm. That sounds terrible, but cubs do wreck and, and the tear and get on. And it's maybe more acceptable that, oh, he's mad, it probably is ADHD, you know. But when it comes to a wee girl, you just, daddies just wrap them in cotton wools. We boys are mommies, we girls are their daddies. They're just that wee bit more overprotective, I think. Mm. But I think we, when there's something we can't control and something we can't understand or, or process, mm-hmm. it's the head in the sand first. Oh, I Denial's the first definitely. support. Mm-hmm. And... It, you know, sometimes parents, when as their children, <coughs> sh- when we've, we've seen this, that they feel like somehow they feel when they yep. haven't. They feel like, uh, you know, it's something they've done. Yeah. So it, it it's probably a common enough uh, response. Mm-hmm. But then men are like this. We're practical. Mm-hmm. So now we need to go and research. Yeah. Because then we feel like we're doing something. Yes. We need to then become... So clued up because we like we we were more practical beings, you mm-hmm. know. We were like, right, this, that, and our not the thought side of things, not the process no. side of things, but this is why this happens and this is what we're doing, and this is what yeah. you know. That's that's I, I think maybe I'm just generalizing, but I think more that's a man thing where we go straight to the practical side of what we're we're now gonna do. Yes. But and then you you know, like this, you're talking about the struggle and this is the part we don't see you know she's still happy she's still in her own wee world and oh she's and, and, but happy now as you and your out. husband are was there a relief when the diagnosis so it explains yes. some things for me it was Laura you're not mad you know what do you say you were right there is you know something that, that you have spotted your, your gut instinct your, your mother instinct your a mother's gut's never wrong do you know what I mean and it's like it was confirmation that I wasn't going mad, that I wasn't seeing things that weren't there, that I wasn't, you know, observing her every day and seeing something different or another trait that she was doing, thinking, is that part of it, is it not? Am I going mad, Laura? Are you trying to see things that's maybe not there? You know, it was confirmation for me. And because I had always had it in my head again from she was that young age as a baby, the day that I got the diagnosis was like a ton of bricks lifted off my shoulder. It was like a wave of relief for me, but also... I had a cry because the child's now not going to be branded as the the mad one in the class or the out really one or, you know, unsettled. You know, we have something there that we can put in place to support her, you know, and it's going to make her school life, her social life, her, her just her whole wee being so much easier, you know. But you, you still do come up, uh, up across things like in the shopping centre and, you know, people are very judgmental and... They don't, they don't see behind closed doors. They don't see what you have to deal with and, and how far we've got. 
to that situation or to that that stage. It's it's hard. But the day that we received that autism diagnosis on the phone, I was saying was my husband. What age was when you when you got that? She was six, almost seven. Yeah. Um. Yeah, she was just before her seventh birthday. Um, that day then that I had got the the confirmation, yes, she has autism and my husband had like bullshit out of him. For me it was relief. For him it was like this is the first time someone has said, Right, there's something here. You know, it was so new for him. It was almost like frustration because what I had been saying for years was right and he wanted me to be wrong. Yeah, it's just so hard. So, so hard. And for long enough like me and him would have been at lockerheads, you know, where, yes, she has autism and ADHD, she also needs parented. You know, you still have to set boundaries and rules and, and routine. And especially with an autistic child, routine is key. Routine is so key. You know, so I would have said, like, the minute you come in from school, straight away, get your clothes, you know, your uniform off, get your changed into your, your comfies or, or whatever, if you're going to um, homework. And then the rest of the day is yours. He would have come in and he'd have said, maybe lifted her from school, Maybe up the town for an ice cream first. It all plastered down the uniform. Come into the house. I might have said, right now to get uniform. Not I says I can go and play first. My Christ, the fucking night. He's just wrecked the day. So that just put the whole thing off balance. He's like, oh, she's only me and leave her alone. I'm going, right, okay. You can deal with her for the next two days. That, that's fine. That's okay. I'm standing back. <laughs> Aye, because it, it sends them into a bit of a spin, doesn't it? It is, because the next day then, when mummy picks her up, mummy brings her home, gets the uniform off, Gets the clothes on, sets the homework book out. My daddy doesn't do this. He lets me go and play. I'm going to be honest with you. That's <laughs> not just autism. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, yeah. that, that. But I'm not, I'm not taking but away. Stick into the that root, routine. Yeah, I, 100% what you're, what you're saying. Because the one clear thing that we had, and we had Sammy on there, his went live this week. And yes. he retired from the army. He loved the army. And I went to it, school with Sammy. Uh, and, well, he had explained that his child was autistic. And he says coming home mm-hmm. and upsetting an apple cart. Oh, daddy's a fun man. And then just clearing off, he says, that that was... Yeah, so hard on the kids. Because, like. and, and the routine, it was mm-hmm. just upsetting the routine. So we, yeah. we're, we're well aware now that it has to, and it has to be that strict, doesn't it? Yeah. And, and it's, and it's hard to be strict. It is really hard to say, I would love her to come in and, and go and run mad and go outside and play. But I know if I don't stick to that routine, Jesus, the next couple of days as a whirlwind. Mm-hmm. And it's like, try, in her head, she knows, right, if I'm coming home, I'm doing this, and then I go, perfect, no problem. But then you get the meltdowns and the tantrums, but daddy doesn't let me do this. And it's the routine in her head that is upset, you know, so you know, it's, it's a hard one. Like. But, you know, when you understand why the children, so with the diagnosis, and this is one thing that we've come to become aware, when you understand why they're doing that, Mm-hmm. It becomes easier to accept. It's not easier. It's not easy. No. But if they're doing certain things and you weren't aware why they were doing that and it was mm-hmm. annoying you and you're maybe shouting and saying stop doing that and all. Mm-hmm. But when you become clear and you start researching and you realize this is why they're doing that, it becomes easier. Yeah. Like this is what we're saying that um, even it's very big at the minute, the Furies, you know, on Netflix, and yes. she's discussing his bipolar, and she was like, I used to get so angry, and she goes, I still do get annoyed, but when you, you realise that with, it's with his bipolar, that it, 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 it made it more, you're like, he's not doing, they're not doing that because they always want to. They they're can't doing, help it. They, they can't help it. Mm-hmm. So, to the degree, you know, I know why I'd be like, people be like, why are they running to get diagnosis? It It's, to more firm and and to say well then this is why mm-hmm. it's not common in girls well when i say it's not common it's not as common for girls as it is for boys it's not right no are you, are you 100 percent sure about that i would say girls mask it far more than what boys do boys will present i but the the, the actual I think it's something like four to one, the actual diagnosis. Oh, the actual diagnosis, yes. In terms of showing traits, girls yes, will okay. mask, and it's harder for girls to get a diagnosis than what it is for boys. Really? Um, well, I, I, I didn't know that. Yeah, well, 
I'm just going by what the your person, all right. the autism um, side of things and, and the girls and the, or the teams that I'd be chatting to, you know, even even teachers as well, they would tell you the same thing. Um, girls mask and boys are easier. It's easier spotted or it's easier diagnosed than boys, whereas girls will mask it so much. Um, it was always explained to me like meltdowns after school. So it was explained to me like a Coke, a bottle of Coke all day. She was in school. Bottle of Coke, shake it, shake it, shake it. Well, she came home. I used to judge how the school day went as how hard the school bag hit the door, you know. And if she came in and the school bag was dropped, fair enough, we had a good day. It was grand. If she came in and that school bag lit the door up, <laughs> we had a bad day, and I was in for it, you know. So that was the lid of the Coke bottle coming off, and it was just all these sentries because she had so many different routines in school, and each day was a different routine. Like one day was PE, another day was maybe, you know, a different topic, and. So much for the child at such a young age with autism to take in and, and process as well. And then having to come home and start homework. Like that's like reliving the school day all over. And see, even like again, the ADHD comes into that because say trying to sit at a table to do homework, even if it's only one page. I mean, she's round the table. She's on the floor. She's looking to climb in the cupboard to look out the window. Can I have a drink? I need a break. You've only done one sum. You know, it's the attention span and the... Oh, uh, it's just crazy, like. But yes, girls do normally mask it. Mine didn't. <laughs> she she was quite her her uh, her traits were quite out there. But um, normally they would say that girls mask more than boys. But yes, the rate is higher for boys. Well, see, just as you're chatting there about um, the whole routine. So, yes. what about holidays then? You know, taking a child out of their home. Do you oh know? God. I just I'm just trying to get my head around it. So you can set the routine in place whenever mm-hmm. you're at home. Then if you want to take a holiday, I'm sure yes. it has problems as well. It has problems because, now again, personally, this isn't for everyone, but knowing my child, and this is how we work it. So say we were going for a week's holiday, I would have to tell her as soon as I knew well in advance. You would research the hotel. I would show her what the building looked like. You know, she would want to say, what's the bathroom look like? Does it have a bath? Is it just a shower? Have we got a view? Is there any shops? Uh, oh, what's the swimming pool look like? Is there a funny smell? And I go, Christ, how am I supposed to know what the place smells like in our country? Do you know what I mean? You have so many things. Then you have also the travelling and the airport and the busy and the noise and the queuing and the, the packing. Oh God, she wanted to put her whole bedroom in. Like there was 50 teddies had to go and, and her blankie and oh, it's just so hard. You know, and even when you were in holidays then, again, sleep. She's not in her own bed. Is a different routine. She's wrecked because she has been playing all day and she's, you know, maybe after travelling in the heat or if you're foreign or wherever, or even if you're just at, at home for a weekend's break, it's still a different environment. It's not what she's used to. She doesn't know. Different bed, the bed sheets, the feeling, everything's just totally different. So we have to literally explain every single process before, before we would go. So at least she has an idea and a visual in her head. Before she gets there and then she's like, oh, yeah, I remember that from the picture. Or, yes, mama, you were right. There is a bath or, you know. That doesn't sound like holly. And I'm just going to say that. Torture. That sounds <laughs> like, oh, my God, I, I would need to take two days off when I come back. Yeah. and It's hard work, like. Now, Wayne's on holiday are hard work. Mm-hmm. But especially when your child's completely sensory overload. Mm-hmm. Cars aren't even on the same side, and they'll pick that up. Like, oh, right. Cars aren't on the same side of the road. People don't sound the same. It doesn't smell the same. Mm-hmm. It's warm. Like, yep. till till the normal child. The heat would make them crab it at the best of times to get used to it, you know. But the overload in in the amount of changes that and we're the food not was always a big picking. One. Food. Oh my god, food was. I mean, the times that I hunted high and low up and down streets for chicken nuggets was. It was Good old McDonald's, no? No, she won't eat McDonald's. Oh shit! She doesn't like their chips. Oh, all right. So you're not, you're not, you're not getting it easy. But yeah. would it put, would it put me off? I, oh, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't think I would have been holidays wouldn't have been big on my list. Like even uh, sitting at the side of the pillion where you get your sunlight during, you want to go on your holidays, relax. Yes, the kids play and whatever. But when you have a child with autism and ADHD, your senses yourself as have been heightened. So you're sitting there at the side of the pool and you maybe opened your book on the first page and you look up and she's our side of the pool and you fuck me how did you get there so quick you know so that you can't I've come home with the same book and haven't turned a page Yeah. you know and it's it maybe still lying in the cupboard I've never got reading it yet but it just do not get two minutes so really for us 
it's unfair to say that it's not a holiday because it is a holiday, but it's not. It's relaxing. It's not relax. It's um, everything at home times 10 because you have to explain everything and the food and the hunting. and the Well, then tell me, Lord, you decided then you want a holiday home here. Yes. Where it would be the same place you're going to each week. Yes. It would be a familiar routine. And and it would then allow you to mm-hmm. sort of relax more. Yes. Where it's not the same with people. She can have her teddy bears there. Mm-hmm. So it, it become, do, w- when did you set out with the idea that you're going to look about a holiday home? So whenever I was younger, my parents had a touring caravan. And at the very start, they went, you know, various different places, but then settled down in that caravan site. And um, at weekends and maybe two weeks in the holidays or various different times, mostly every weekend, but then you had your bank holidays and Easter and whatnot were always there. And I grew up down there on my holidays as a kid. Where's the, where, where? So this is in Golden Sands in Benoe. Right, Benoe. Yeah. Yes. And um, we had went down there, uh, as I say, as a kid, and I loved it. You know, a child down there. I think for, for the the parents' relaxing point of view as well, you were away from the hustle and bustle of, of Port Rush, Port Stewart, Barry's being, being the nemesis. Um, so you had the beach, you, you had a bucket and a spade, you went to the sandpit, you played in the park, you made your friends. You went out in the morning and after your breakfast, if you, if you, if you were lucky enough to eat your breakfast, sometimes you get up in the morning and you just bolted. You didn't care about food, you just, where's my mates, go call for them. You know, when you played all day, you only come home again, as I say, like if you were looking something or something to eat, and then you're in at night, and I just loved it. And it was some time when I was in secondary school, my parents sold their caravan, the touring caravan, and uh, we were all getting up a bit, and we didn't want to go down, or one wanted to stay at home, and it was just, just wasn't working out. So um, for years then, there was no caravan. And then... Covid hit, and I decided I want a caravan. I want, you know, my child to experience what I did as a child and the wee free spirit and the beach and the sandpit and the playing, and especially with her again autism and ADHD, she had free scope to run. You know, she she was fit to go to the park and it was a safe environment as we thought, and um, she was fit, to, uh, you know, mix with other people other than her school friends and her wee ones at home, you know, and it did. I gave her a sense of, a sense of, um, what's what's the word I want to say? I give her a sense of nearly security, a home security, away from home. Yeah, and, uh, freedom. Again, yeah, I wouldn't say not so, so much freedom because, you know, you were. Well, it is in a sense because, you know, she was allowed to go down to the park and, you know, play with her friends. But at every single time you knew where she was, yeah. where she was going, you know, who she was with. And, well, this and is the whole sorts. point of these communities that, that when you're here and you, you get to know people. You, you, Everyone you knows each other's kids. They can go and play in the park and, you yeah. you know, someone's got an eye. And, yeah. and, and people are sitting judging now when I say this. Back when we were cubs, like my... You, our Caravan bunch, life. Our we part. love caravan oh, life. We unreal. used to... My granddad got rest him. He had a caravan down more. Yes. And uh, it was it was a tow caravan, but it always stayed on this wee patch of grass. Yeah. Um, and it was relations of ours that owned the land. But uh, no running water, no toilet, no nothing. <laughs> and uh, every morning it was taking this barrel of water across into a farm to across the road up. to fill it up with yeah. a wee tap on the bottom. And it was a routine every morning. Yeah. But you couldn't have swung a cat in it. Like me and my... Me and my Three brothers and a man, da. So six of us stuck in this wee small caravan. But do you mean it? Oh, we being ten. So well, what I mean is, but the memories. It, when see, sun come up, yeah. the sun come down. You didn't aye. see. That's what I mean. Mm-hmm. Like I went out in the morning. Lucky if I ate my breakfast. Uh-huh. I was just busting to get out the door mm-hmm. and away and playing. Maybe my you mates. needed a couple of pounds for an ice cream or something. You come back. Aye. And but as like, sure as God, you were at your your friend's caravan and their mummies were saying, "Here, look, there's a plate. Eat them up." You know, we are friends. We always got fed some road direction. You know, back then, like there was. Yeah, but it was brilliant. That's what I was saying. But even now, so much these communities, you still have that air of of safety, or as we oppose, mm-hmm. there's safety. Yeah. Um, me and Sean's view of the world is becoming more and more warped from the stories that we have heard over the last while, and yeah. it starts to open your eyes to the evil that, that that's out there that we we were completely naive and blind to. And I don't mm-hmm. think our parents knew anything about. It. Not that people have got more evil now. Maybe they have, but back then it was just a given that. Yeah, we're not roaring and shouting for you. We're not roaring yeah. and shouting for you later on in your dinner. 
come for you in there. Like, and that was a running joke. I used to street lights come on here. My mom will look at me. I better go in. And 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 that that was our summer childhood summers. And you ha- you look back with all memories, and obviously when you have that fondness and Sean, like me and Sean talk about, you know, as, as time goes on and you you start going for and holly. Your memory of your best holidays is still the childhood memories. Yeah, of course. And then you get this where you want to give it to your children. Well, that's exactly where I was because as time went on and then COVID hit, you know, and, you know, I think COVID was a funny time. Well, I don't think I know it was. It was awful time for for everyone, but for us, I thought, right, caravan. What what do I know best? What do, what's going to help? You know, what's going to um. What what's gonna do it for us? Because you have to think of a package. You yeah. have to think what works for all of you. Yeah, you couldn't go on holidays. You couldn't do that. So we decided, right, caravan. And I says to my husband, I'm gonna buy a caravan. And he's fucking sure you're buying no caravan. He says, I'm not stealing no caravan. He hates them with a passion. <laughs> and I says, Oh Christ, what am I gonna do? And me being me, I'm stubborn. And I five my head set and something. That's that's it. It's a sh- it's a sure thing. It's a gore. <laughs> so I went this day and uh, seen this caravan down at Benong and met the lady. Now I hadn't the money to buy it at this stage and I went down and I says to the lady or you know down talking to her or whatever and we shook on it and I says right I'll take it and I says look he's going to kill me he's going to kill me and I says look two weeks time I'll come down we'll pick it up good to go no nah, no problem 100% so I come up that day and I says to my husband I've kind of done something he says what have you done now I says I bought a caravan well he says, you can go on it yourself. I'm not bestowing a no caravan, this, that, and the other. Cut a long story short. Uh, I said, I'm not going to come down and stay for one night to humour the child. Like, I loved it when I was down there. It'll be great for her. It'll be somewhere that we can go. You know, obviously, we can't go for or nothing. As you say, like, it's a full package. She can keep her wee things there. You're only an hour up the road. Perfect. What more do you want? So I came and I says, right, I'll stay for the one night. Just a happy wife, happy life and all that as well. And he stayed for, he came down that night to stay and he didn't go home for three months. <laughs> <laughs> and I, he changed his mind then? Yeah, oh yes. And I thought, oh no, now I'm oh, not no, only no. stuck with him at the house. <laughs> what have I done? <laughs> Be careful sure what saying, you wish for. Short of saying here, hold on a minute, this is my wee sanctuary, put on up the road, like give me a nice pace. But no, he loved it. And I was very, very surprised because he was dead set. He ain't staying on no bean tin. Like, that's just, nope, not doing it. Like, and again, ours was just a tour and a tour, no one you pull behind the car or whatever. Um, and then we eventually got a seasonal pitch. So it was there, you know, from start to end of season, March to Halloween time. Um, so this would have been another three or four years, I can't remember now. Um, possibly under our fourth year caravan and all together, but owned it for three years, if you know what I mean. So that's that's how it came uh, about. So you were there a couple of years, and um, you obviously had settled in the community. You were mm-hmm. the, you, you, your caravan was there. Yes, it stayed there. We I have never we had never brought it home from. I bought it there. It went on to a pitch, and right. that's where it stayed. Um, but things weren't the happiness of of having this. Will took a turn. Unfortunately, yes. Um, this is a bit that I want to touch on for, again, awareness, because I will state that what happened with the sexual grooming and the sexual assault, that is not my story to tell. The ends and that for by the legal side of thing, that is my child's story. That is up to her when she feels the time is right for her in years to come, that she wants to, you know, to disclose that aspect of things that that's up to her. But what I will say is for, for awareness and for parents, it's the signs to look out for. Never once, never once in our minds, in our head, did we ever, ever think that we things that she was presenting with, different things that she was saying, different things she was doing, different things that she wouldn't do, that she normally did and loved, um, was all a sign of sexual abuse and sexual grooming and... Um, I'm sorry to be specific, but what what do you mean that things you would have noticed and, and different things? Yeah, but so it's, and 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 I'm sorry to ask you that, but no, no, I think it's, fine. it's important for people listening yeah. that if they see them signs mm-hmm. to look out for them. Yeah, a hundred percent. So, um, again, back to the not sleeping. We had got her into a great routine with her melatonin and everything. She was sleeping. We come back to not sleeping. Didn't want to go to the caravan. 
didn't want to go and play with her friends, didn't want to go to school. Her meltdowns were a lot worse. Um, her, her eating, she refused to eat for days on end, just wouldn't eat. She kept saying, I've sore eyebrows, that means a sore head. Um, but that meant a sore tummy. So I always, you know, where, where she tells me she has sore eyebrows, that's a sore head, a sore tummy, because it's hunger pains. And she's hungry, but she won't eat because she's sore. So she thinks if she eats, it's going to make it worse. But really, she needs to eat to make it better. Um, they not wanting to be touched. She was always a huggy, a huggy child. You know, you went to give her a hug, no hugs. She wouldn't go out wearing a T-shirt, like hot summer's day. Not a chance. She had a hoodie stepped up to her throat. And I used to think, would you take that hoodie off? You're going to be sweltered, darling. You know, you had a wee T-shirt on, a wee pair of shorts, and away you go, no, no, no. Everything had to be tucked in. T-shirt tucked in, hoodie on, arms folded. I've seen maybe a hoodie and a coat over the top of that again and a hood up. Earphones in, didn't want to look at anyone, didn't want to talk to anyone, didn't want to um, just be touched in general or or to be spoke with or, or anything. She just literally went into like a wee recluse, like a wee literally zone of her own. And I thought, is this because of COVID, because there's no skill? Is this because of autism? Is it something she's at that's put her off food? You know, is it someone has said something to her again? Has the bullying started outside with her with her friends, you know, in the estate or whatever? Never, ever, ever once did we ever think they were signs of, of sexual abuse because down there was our safe place. We knew everyone. You know, everyone looked out for each other's kids. It was a it was our go to place. It was she loved it. And then just slowly but surely didn't want to go. No mommy to want to go this weekend. Why not, darling? Not just. And can you remember how long that went on for? Do you know the sort of the t-shirts didn't want to wear t-shirts? That's still on. going on. But but it's sort of until you had found out. <coughs> oh, what up was until going we on. had found so out. So how long before you'd found out? That would have been roughly about four and a half five months. Mm -hmm. You know, and because it had went on for so long, then. Um, you try and you try and but and because we never thought that that's what it was, it wasn't our, it wasn't in our minds to think, God, is that what it is? You know, um, but in those four to five months, then because she didn't want to wear a t-shirt, so I just said, well, I'll buy you a lighter hoodie. You know, that one's too thick. It's a big fleecy, fluffy one, whatever. Change that. Um, come with me, and you can pick your own dinner. You know, you pick whatever you want, and try and encourage her to eat and. With the sleeping, she um, didn't even want to lie in our bed to fall asleep. She just wanted to be on her own. She didn't even want us to lie in her bed with her. She just different things that she was coming with. We tried to then, you know, work around those to like, get her to eat and, and get the sleeping back on track. But never, never thought that's what it was, you know. So coming a teenager, you weren't, all, you weren't going to, you know, straight away that children go through phases and different she was things. eight and a half nine oh she uh, sorry so she was do you know what I mean so what had happened then that you become aware then of what had happened I remember it like it was yesterday it was a Saturday night and I actually didn't find out till the Sunday morning but she had uh, came home or not came home came back to the caravan on the Saturday evening and there's a there's a situation around that which I can't I can't disclose because of witnesses. Um, do you know Do you know what I mean? There's something the the witnesses involved in that evening and the build up to it, and I can't say. But what I can say is that evening she came home and she told her daddy straight away, um, because of what had happened. Um, that night it had got to a point where she feared for her life, so she knew at that stage, I need to tell my daddy or my mommy, and. We were there and she told her daddy and he approached me that night and he says, I need to tell you something in the morning, but I don't know how to tell you. And I was like, what is it? And he says, no, I'll, I'll speak to you in the morning about it. But he, in his head, I think he just went numb. He froze. Like he never spoke another word to me that night. He went to bed and I remember that night like he was lying in bed and he was all like, you could feel his shoulders going up and down like, crying. And I thought, what the hell? I never even thought it was something to do, to do with I thought, what's he got to tell me? Got up the next morning and it was it was early, still sleeping. Came outside, we had the awning up, sat out in the awning and he broke down and he told me, 
told him and I thought, what? I was like, you know, why did you not tell me this last night? He says, look, I couldn't even put the words out of my mouth. I'm sitting here and I'm still in shock. I'm, I want to kill dead things. I want to hug her, but she won't let me touch her. I want to... I don't even know what he wanted to do. He didn't even know himself how to process it. And I think until he told me the next morning and tried to work out in his head how to tell me, how to tell a mother that, you know, they are the other parent, that their daughter had been sexually groomed and assaulted for several months. It was, it was a shocker. It was, that was the day that my heart was smashed in a million pieces. It, um, <laughs> I promised myself I wouldn't break down in this one. But thinking back to that Sunday morning, I don't even know how I took my next breath. Take a wee second. <laughs> and then I had to go into the caravan. And look at her. <laughs> no, what that bastard done to her. <laughs> Sorry, just take a wee second. Thank you. It, um, my heart will never be the same from that Sunday morning. Never. Like it just it won't, and no matter how much we, how much counselling you get, how much you talk about it, how much you, you fight for justice, I can't undo what he did. And it's something that we all, and especially her, will live with for the rest of our lives. And it's so hard. Well. Laura, I, I'm going to ask you some details here, and it's not, it's just to give clarity of this here. Yes. And it's not to, to push you or press you, and if there's things we can't talk about, that's fine. And yeah. because this is still an ongoing legal situation. It is, fact. yes. So we never want to be, if anything happened here, that we were getting in the road of justice, and, and yes. these people get what they need. But obviously, then your daughter has come. I, I don't know, I even know how I'm saying this. Your husband's come and told you that your daughter has been sexually assaulted. Mm -hmm. She was eight and a half at the time. Yeah. Like, I can't begin to process that. And, and a lot of times I try to have empathy and, and understanding. I can't begin to process that. Um, What what initially went through your head? What initially, you know, obviously there was anger and rage. I, I, I wanted to kill him. I, I don't. I just don't blame you. And I can't sit here and say that I thought otherwise, because I would be a liar. I wanted to kill him. This was a, a, a single person. Yes. And your daughter had told your husband that this person had done this. Yeah. Um. Was this someone known to you? Yes. So, as I was saying, whenever I was a child growing up down there, he was there. Now he's only a few years younger than myself, maybe two years younger than myself. So around the same age, but he was always um, with ones younger than himself as well. But he was always there and always known to everyone. And through the years, all, everyone knew him. And, you know, he was working voluntary at the caravan site as well, between daily um, cutting of the grass and locking the park and cleaning the toilets and various jobs around around the site. Um, his family are very good friends with and possibly a relation, although I, I can't verify that. Um, it has been spoken about um, with the caravan site owners. And that's how he had come to be working there as well, you know. So this this was somewhere you had been coming from your way. You'd known this person for years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's always the bad. It's always fucking someone we know, but... Mm -hmm. So they were in a position of trust. They worked in in the park, and you, there was you'd never nothing to never. suspect, you know. And as I say, for those for those almost five months that she presented differently, you know, at the very start, the minute we pulled in, say on a Friday evening, you know, after school, picked her up straight to the caravan. 
down the road. Um, Eva has seen us coming through the gate straight up like a bullet. You know, does you want to come and help me lock up the park or you want to come and maybe, you know, go for a walk or we'll go and see what's happening or play Pokemon or whatever. And I thought, oh God, and she was all busy, you know, at the start, you know, getting a wee job to do and thinking this was great and helping out and, you know, chasing the kids out of the park and locking it up in different bits. And again, that was another one of thinking back now that she didn't want to go to the caravan. She didn't want to go and lock the park up anymore. She didn't want to, um, even if we did get her down to the caravan, she didn't want to go out because she didn't want to see him. She didn't want to be in that position. You know, so he, that's where the grooming and the trust came. So he not only built trust and um, groomed her, but he had... Your trust? Our trust. As parents, we trusted him with, with our child. You know, that we had no reason to believe otherwise. You know, he was well known. Everyone knew him. He was there working around the place. No, you know, a couple of years younger than myself. No no harm. You know, he, he was and trusted. But that's bound to be so, so hard. You know, unbelievable. That you yourself as a parent. Absolutely unbelievable. Puts trust into another with your child. adult. With your own child. Yep. And then something as awful as that happens. Yep. But that doesn't mean you can't trust everybody. If that make, I'm, I'm not saying you know, if you were that way and you didn't trust anybody at all, yeah, with anybody, mm-hmm. well then, exactly. How would you how would you go about things? Exactly. You just it's it's just unbelievable. Like. But that's the thing. You 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 were going to that caravan site. You knew that person very very well from years ago. Years yes. ago. So Do you know what it, I mean? It wasn't like just oh, this is just somebody who. Randomly turned up. Exactly. Not not even randomly turned up, but somebody that, you know, just you knew him for a while and he was a nice person. Mm-hmm. This was somebody that you knew from your young. Yeah, I knew him from when I was younger, as I say. And then for years we had left because the parents had sold the caravan and then going back and, well, he was still there, obviously. And and he was, um, you know, now working on the site and everyone, there, there, there isn't a person on that site that's there permanent doesn't know him. Do you know what I mean? Well, that night... Obviously, we're not, it's hard because I understand we have to provide the details, but to give mm-hmm. the best case, the, not the case, and sometimes I say things and, and I listen back and I was like, that sounds horrible. But to for people to understand the situation, and people will understand, and also people judge. And that's mm-hmm. people have to judge. Nobody will judge worse than yourself, and you beat yourself up. You trust people, mm-hmm. you let people in, and and this happens, and you you know, <laughs> it. There's other children on the site. Yeah, that was a big thing for me and my husband because we thought I beat myself up for long enough. It's our fault we allowed her to go out with him. You can't we do allowed. that. You know, you we can't. You can't. Uh, you, you, any any victim of abuse, any parent of of a child of abuse. There's all the what ifs, the what the mm-hmm. buts, the maybes. Well, here we've been through them all. And and as a parent, I I completely I get it. You 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 question and all, and and people out there will be like, why did you? Let, and I'm not. Mm-hmm. Oh no, hundred percent. Because I, I I know from the way you talk, the love you have for your child and the care you have for your child. Yeah. I, I'm not. I people out there, they'll want to say things and they'll judge and blah. blah. That's that's. They don't know. Yeah. They're 100%. not there. But. You, you obviously judge yourself and you're like, we shouldn't have done that. That mm-hmm. was the thing because in hindsight, it's easy to always say these, we shouldn't have done this, we should have watched yeah. out for that. And the signs you're saying, it's like when things happen, you now see them from before, yeah. but at the time you just dismiss them and go, that's that. Now and they that's just that. add up. Now it all adds up. It, it makes, all, it's clear. It, yeah, it makes sense. You know, it all adds up. It was like, that's why she didn't want to go to the caravan. That's why she, whenever he called, she froze. Like the minute on a Friday, he was straight up to our caravan looking her, you know, and on the weekends that we, or the week or the holiday time or whatever at, at that period, whenever we were there that she didn't want to go out, like she would have put herself in the toilet. No, I'm on the toilet, I'm not coming out. And I said, no, she doesn't want to come out this evening. What then happened? But then he would have come back again, maybe a couple of hours. Oh my God. Can, can, I, can she come out now for a walk and help me lock the park maybe later on that evening? And then the child had no excuse or maybe I'm tired or... And we were saying, okay, you sure, Darren, you sure do you want to go out? We, we didn't know what was going on. Now it makes sense. Yeah. That's up. What happened then? What was the next step? You, you, 
husband's come and told you this fucking awful news awful mm. thing. what 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 was your next what was the next thing to happen then did you go and confront this guy no did I, you speak to the owners well that whenever my husband told me that that sunday morning when i went in as i say and went in then she told me herself bits and pieces not not the full thing back then but bits and pieces more has come out i suppose since that and since her, her re-interviews and speaking with police and that because again she thought that she was in trouble she was in the wrong and this was her fault as well but that day that sunday i packed the car and i drove home put a child in it me and my husband child one dog at the time packed the car didn't care about the caravan I didn't even take clothes out of the cupboard. I didn't. I think I even still left the milk. I, I, I just into the car home, and I remember going home and I broke. And that journey home that day was always I spy or what colour cars next or something. It was silence. It was eerie. It was who speaks? What do I say? As as my husband says something, I'm going to break. So I can't speak because he'll cry. Then the child will pick up on it and then think because she's told us that we're, it, it was the most horrible drive. And we got home and I remember she went up and I, she wanted to, you know, go up into her room or whatever. And I says, that's fine. And she went up into her wee room and I remember coming downstairs to the sofa and I buried my face in the pillow and I screamed and I broke. And I just thought, what do we do? Where do we go from here? So we were friendly with the, I suppose, the current grounds man that, that's down there. And I thought, I'll ring him. Because obviously he was working with him on the side as well. So I rang him and I said, look, I don't even know how I'm going to tell this to you. I'm fully process- processed it myself, whatever. I had my husband with me. And I told him. And it was like, oh my God. Oh my God. I says, what do I do, do I go to the office do I how do, how do I go about this do we go to him personally you know the child doesn't want to talk about it what do we do so he says look I'll I'll have a chat with him let the office know so again that's another side that I for legal reasons that I that I can't divulge into but um, myself and my husband had then went to the office to the owners and made them aware of what what had happened and it was no I don't want to know anything about that no it's that's not right. No, that's that's nonsense. And we were just first under the carpet. Out you go. And In what way? And literally, no, I want nothing to do with any of that nonsense. That was that was his. So who did you approach? Stanley Walls. Stanley Walls, who is the yeah. is the owner He's the of owner. The Golden Sands, yeah, Benone. and you told him that one of his workers had sexually assaulted your child, yeah. and he told you that he didn't want to know any of that nonsense. There was no, no process, no answer, no nothing. What was it? Well, and I'm sorry to say, it, what was his exact words? What what, what is? I, I get his demeanor, but what did he say to you? I don't want anything to do with any of that nonsense. As you, straight faced as I'm looking at you now, saying I, that you told him, yes, your child had been sex assaulted on his caravan park. Myself and my husband went into that office. And he was at the other side, the counter side, and he was going in. So the other side was his like private office. But I said, "Can I have a word with you?" I went in there, and the door was open. Like he didn't even have the manners to close the door. And we had said, "Look, there's a situation has arisen." Was he aware? Would had this grounds man give him a heads up? Was he yeah. aware? Right. Okay. Uh, were you, were you charged? Now you can't not be charged. Did you arrive in? Because I'm only looking to give a, a, a clear because I know what I did on. Oh, yeah. I know wh- what way this mm-hmm. was going down. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, if that mom, we haven't reached out to him to give his side of, of what was said. Yeah. But he may have, but he says to you, he knew what you were coming about. Yes. Did he allow you to tell him what had happened? He had already been informed, as I say, from the ground. But did he allow you to say? Oh, yeah, he allowed us to say. He's like, what can I help you with? What's the problem? No one, right? Like, what we were coming in for, because he had already been informed. Like, parents, Was there someone else outside? Uh, had he left the door open purposely that someone else could be? 
Uh, uh, no, there was no one else there that day. Um, he, as I say, like he was going between the two, so he would be like at the office. I'm not even sure where the brother, the other owner, John Stanley's brother, was. Um, but that day, whenever we went in, we just said, like, I have a private word with you. So we went into his office, and that's what we had said. Like, we have a situation here. We don't know what to do, but we need to inform you this is what has happened with one of your workers on your site. Oh, no, he says, I don't want nothing to do any of that nonsense. I don't understand. No one does. Well, no, no, but I, uh, y- you own a, fa- a family holiday home. Yep. Why is your first thought to take this person out of here? Now, I'm going to be honest with you. His first thought doesn't have to be to believe you. No. No, and, and I'm not saying I'm not saying whether I believe, but it doesn't have to be. Mm-hmm. But if there's one percent chance of what you're saying might be true to to him, now, yes, he has a duty of care. To not only my child but other children on that side. In this case, volunteer. Yes. So he's getting free labour off him. Oh, I. And that the motive of volunteering. Well, apparently. The motive to to work in somewhere for free. I understand how people do jobs for free when if it's helping in a care home or they get like a, a sense of help but to till till do groundwork, which is hard manual labour. Mm-hmm. You want to know the motive of why you put yourself in there and why you're there so long, but I can't get my head around how this is obviously I'm probably a wealthy person from this year, that, that yeah. they've a lot of things. They've decided that I don't want nothing to do with this. Stanley and Walls I'd and the Walls company, the Walls. Well, Stan, yeah, I will say Stanley Walls because that's the one. Although there's there's three of them. There's him and his son and his brother. That's now, we, we can only talk for the ones that have said something. That's what I mean. So that's so why I'm saying I'm only going with Stanley because he's the one that we approached and that's the one that we had the conversations with. He is judge, jury and executioner on that side. There's no, it's his his way or the highway. No, no, no. Do you think he reacted that way because he knew? Oh, 100%. Because he knew of... There's been allegations previous to this. Yeah. One. Yeah. Because we've spoke to various different people and usually what comes back is that that person, the perpetrator... It's not a first there, time. There, there's people around mm-hmm. him or her that, so that know that it's going on. Yeah. They know that it's going on. It and, is. And they've heard of it and they're like... You just don't talk about it. It didn't happen. That's exactly what it was. And it's so since our since our so we had been trying to deal with that following that conversation. I don't even know where we got to after that. It was just a a, a blank. Um, I remember coming home and having the conversation on numerous occasions. Like we didn't go for a few weeks to the caravan. Obviously, we stayed away and whatever. And I said to the child, you know reporting this we need we need to report it and I had we had rang the police you know or I had rang the police my husband with me and we had said you know about what had happened and they said well there's nothing that we can do unless the child speaks and she needs to give her her version of events and and um, accept that she wants to speak to the police and and all the, this legal tape that now goes wait, about wait, it wait a minute yeah. I'm finding this hard we've been hard to process right mm-hmm. and, and I'm not I'm not picking at you, but I I don't right. So you left that you left the office. That guy said you wanted nothing to do. You left, and you've no, you you now have no alternative but to contact the police. Yes. Do, did you then once you were speaking to the police, they would have put you through to a, a office like a specialist department? No. Nope. So who, who who did you speak with in the police? It was just I rang one hundred one to make a to make a complaint to make a but an, an operating system for 101 wouldn't have says to you no we can't do this with the child oh no I was put through to a, a police oh, officer oh, okay right yeah yeah and that's when I had said look I need to report that this has happened and they asked you know where it was and who it was and the child and I said obviously my child and where it was and who it was and I said um, is she will she make a statement and I said she doesn't want to talk she doesn't want to but be his parents we have to do something and they said no unless the child comes forward about it herself and makes a statement there's nothing they can do about it no i can't have that i yep. i there uh, uh. so that's a hurdle that we had at the very start and i said but she's eight and a half no how uh, no and, and there's going to be outraged police here mm-hmm. there is go and and because this there's a bigger question oh, i for have me. been to ombudsman and everything i because there's no way any police person worth their salt mm-hmm 
a child's been sexually assaulted, yep. that they're like, no, nah, the child's not come forward at eight and a half. Mm-hmm. Child coming forward and making a statement is a very small part of a very intricate investigation that has to start. 100%. I, you're, you're, I'm not saying you're not telling me because. I'm not questioning though, but I you're emotionally in this and, and you're distraught and a lot of stuff's happening. Mm-hmm. Was that the full extent of what was the exchange there? Because they've got to have had a comeback. They've got to come out to you. They've got to send a, a special support officer. They've got to have interviewed you. They, no. I, I can't. There's a there's a breakdown of, I, I don't think this is police procedure because there's been a breakdown here. Not one person ever phoned me back to say, are you okay? Is your child okay? Is your husband okay? We will go and speak to the park. We will do anything. There's a family liaison officer. Zero. Unless the child speaks, there's nothing they can do. She has to come forward and make the statement because she has to be the one that goes, you know, to, to court and make the video statement and whatever with being a minor. And I right. said, but I am the mother. I am telling you this has happened. Yeah, but we need the child. So I slammed the phone down. I thought, fuck you. That, that, was, that was my reaction. I thought, fuck you. And I thought, if this is the way that this country is working, that you lift the phone and you go to the PSNI with something as serious as this and that's the answer you get back, I'm going to deal with this my own way. You know, th- th- there has to be another way or, or some other authority that I can bring in to help or manage or report or, or something. Well, what was your next step? I, I, I'm getting angry. Yeah. Oh, because yeah. first thing... I'd have probably fucking broke the cunt's neck. Yeah. Right? And I'm not saying that would have g- genuinely the worst case scenario. It probably was the worst thing to do because it, it I, I don't think, and I think this, and I'm sure your husband, I'm sure you had to restrain your husband because. <laughs> Many times. I think this is a, a male response. We don't know what to do. We, we're, we're a protective creature. Yeah. And women have the foresight of consequence mm-hmm. in, in these where they will be like, if we do that, this will happen where men don't have consequence. Yeah. It, it would, would come into your head what was going to happen. But as I went down this, and as I even listened to this, mm-hmm. I'm getting more and more frustrated. Um, Obviously, there's some of the details we're not fully aware of. And yeah. we, we, you spoke of a witness. So, like, the fact that there's been a witness to this, um, your, your daughter's told you, and you're relaying this to an officer, mm-hmm. and they have now not willing to take a, a statement, they haven't issued, uh, they, they haven't went and questioned this person. Well, we had three witnesses. Nah, Laura. Yep. There's this something is... not, there's something missing here or left out here or something not right. There's no way you can phone up a police officer and say, we have three witnesses, this has happened, yep. and they don't, there's something, I, I, I feel like there's something either, I would want to get who this police officer was. Yep. I want them reported. I have asked that and they've lost the recording. There's no record of it. Who did you, you, you obviously done a freedom of information request for this year. Did you approach your solicitor or the ombuds office or? or Ombudsman. Who? Right. So the, that call, that advice is completely wrong. For anyone listening to this, this is my biggest worry about this. Mm-hmm. It's not the police. There, there'll be police responding to this and we've yeah. seen them respond to ours. Yeah. They'll be angry. Yeah. Because they want to protect children. Mm-hmm. There is services out there specifically set up and it's so hard. Yeah. It is so hard for them. To, they they are dancing with two feet tied together. Oh, I want them but to respond. I want them to If somebody give me an approached answer. them with three witnesses yes. of this mm-hmm. and they refuse to act mm-hmm. because an eight year old and what well, how strong would an eight year old statement be anyway? Because she wouldn't I, give first hand account it was Basically, but how many children? My word against her. But how many children can give a first hand account again? Not all. There's, it's angered me. Right, I right. I'm going to take a second here. What was your next? What was your next move? So I went back on the phone then to the grounds man, um, and I had said to him, "This is where we're at. The police won't act on this because." Like she won't give the statement now. She's the child can't even process it yet. She's just went under a reshell. That that's it. I'll have a word with the owners. So he came back and he said, "Look, he's to be kept. He's not allowed to lock a park anymore. He's not allowed to clean the toilets on his own. He's to be kept away. He's to have no contact with yourself or your husband or your child. He's been warned. Stay away." And I thought, right, until such times, we're going to have to make do until speaks because no one else is listening. 
And it took us a long time again then to try and get even as I say, like the, the jumper and the hoodie situation and the and the just you know, getting back to being a child. But the caravan season had ended, so this was like after Halloween. So we weren't due back until March. And we hummed and had, what do we do? Do we just rip it off the site? Or do we leave it there? Or what do we do? So we thought, do you know what? We have, we're away from the site. Maybe her being away, she'll open up and she'll talk and we'll report and we'll do X, Y and Z. And we'll go through the proper channels and we'll again try again. And got Christmas over and done with. And it came um, close to March um, for the season and opening, the caravan season opening again. And I had said, you know, darling, do you want to go back to the caravan? She says, but I miss all my friends. And I thought, oh my God, what am I going to do? And I says, but you remember what happened down there after what you told mommy and daddy? She says, I know, but he's not allowed to see me and I won't see him. And, you know, it's my wee friends and I love my caravan and the beach. And that was, again, her routine, her, her wee place. And for her, it wasn't about the place. You know, people say to me, but why did you go back? I say, but it wasn't because it was the place. It was the person. It's like if it happened next door to you, if it happened in your home, if it happened somewhere, would you would you leave your own home? You know, would you would you leave because there was someone next door to you that, that had done that? No, you wouldn't. You would stand your ground and fight because you don't run away from this. You stand and you fight and you speak up and you raise awareness and you do not let them win. You'd already taken so much from that child. Why take that wee bit of happiness and, uh, and and her wee caravan and her wee friends away from her. That would just be punishing her again. And again, that was her decision. And I says, well, as long as you want to, that is fine. It was totally in her, in her ball, in her corner. I says, look, I, I have no problem. Daddy will go down there and I rip the caravan home. No, mummy, I want to go back see my friends. And I says, right, OK, we'll, we'll go down. I says, but we'll only go down for one night. See how you feel. Look, if, if it's any different, Straight up the road. Don't even have to stay that night. The manager you say, I won't go home, mummy. We're up that road. It's We're up in an hour. So we did. The season opened. And we went down. And she saw him. And she came in and she broke down. She says, mummy, I want to tell. Well, again, that was just like a weight off my shoulders. I thought, oh my God, you wee darling are standing there telling me that she knew that it was wrong that he was even there. She knew that she did not want to set eyes on him. And her wee words to me, and I remember it that day, I remember it was Friday, no, it was a Tuesday evening, she said to me, Mommy, what if he does it to me again? <laughs> and I just thought, no, <laughs> this can't fucking happen. That just can't happen. I won't allow it. So not only did the disregard what a mother and a father had come and told him about a worker, they had said that they would keep him away. They didn't. They just disregarded, like, fuck you. He can do whatever he wants. He, he's here. There's nothing you can do about it. So he was allowed to come. And um, we went to the police station. We took her down into the police station and uh, in Limavati. And she went in with her wee blankie and she gave her statement. And there was things even in that statement that she hadn't disclosed to us at that stage. But she knew that it was a female officer and she's fascinated by the place, you know. She just thought, right, I need to get this all off my chest in one go and then I can go and play with my friends. I thought, oh my God. So her statement was made. And that police officer said that he would be arrested. So... I said, how do we stand with the caravan park? What happens now? What you know? Are you going tonight to arrest them, or will it be tomorrow? It says we'll put it across to the child protection team, which up in Strand and not in Derry, Derry, not in Derry, whatever. And uh, she said that lady police officer said, <laughs> "You go and enjoy your your wee caravan, darling. You will never see him again. He will never harm you." He will, you will never see him again. You play with your free, wee friends. You know, we got this. We're, we're here to support you. We believe you being the main thing. You know, everything, we will we will help you. And we come home. We're back down to the left limb of Valley, back down to the caravan. And um, the next day, 
he was still there. And I rang the police and I said, he's still here. We were told that he would be arrested. He wasn't to be here. Uh, the child protection officer will ring you. And again, this is another failing of the PSNA and another reason why we went to the Ombudsman to try and clear this up. We were assigned a child protection officer and he made contact with us and said the following week, bring her up into the social services office up in Mackerfeld where she would be assigned because she has autism as well. She would get her is it an ABE member um, with a social worker and like an intermediary. Sorry, that's what I... She would get the intermediary and everything would be explained to us up there. And we went up and into social services and she went in and they explained everything to her and said, look, you've took your statement, but before this can go any further, now this is to my child last year, who was nine at this stage, do you consent to go on to court and speak in about this? Now what does a nine-year-old know about court? What does a nine-year-old know about statements? What does she know about an intermediary? What does she know about a social worker? All she knew was telling mummy and daddy that something was wrong. And mummy and daddy would try and fix it. And by going to the place that they would help. And I had said to them, they took her into a room by herself with the social worker and intermediary and the policeman. And they had said to her, you know, I don't know what they'd done that day. Was it like a wee colouring in book or a, or a drawing or a puzzle or something? And, you know, getting to know them. And I said, look, if she doesn't consent, what happens? Oh, I'll just be spoken to. I mean, you fucking what? Spoken to? She's nine. She is nine. And me and my husband stood in the corridor that day and looked at each other and went, this is a disgrace. This is an actual disgrace. So if my Wayne comes out of there and says, oh no, I don't want to go to court because they told her there'll be cameras on you, there'll be this, there'll be that. And if you have to go to court, but you'll be in another room away from mummy and daddy and you know, you'll know you not see him in court, but you'll be in video like, now this is scary. If somebody told me that and I'm 34, I'd be like, holy shit, I'm trying to process that but for a child. So she had to sit there and God love that creator. She agreed to each and every bit of it. She said yes, because... Um, I don't want them doing it to my friends either. <laughs> That's how strong that child is. God love her. That's how strong that child is. And she came out that day and she said, Mommy, did I do good? <laughs> And we took her down and got her ice cream. And I got a booked into the cold. I got a booked into the... <laughs> so at this stage, I said to them before we left that day, have you arrested him yet? No, the child protection officer up in Strand didn't see fit to arrest him. I mean, what? Are you serious? <laughs> I said, no. He doesn't see fit. He'll just be brought in for a voluntary interview. While we had this to process, he was still allowed to lock the toilets, to clean the toilets, both male and female, to open and close the play park with innocent children. Laura, was the three people that witnessed this, did they make a statement? Yeah. Did the police have a statement at this time? So I actually don't know because that child protection officer that we were assigned that made the decision that he didn't feel fit to arrest him at that stage even after the statements that the child gave and, and everything um, he was the most ignorant man the reception that we got from him was disgusting so following that um, he wouldn't give us any details he was just that's the, way, that's the way it is. That's the way the system goes. If there's any updates, I'll let you know. But I never did. So, uh, two weeks. I think it was maybe a week and a half or two weeks later. Sometime after that day at the social services office. um, It was set up that she would do her video statement. But it was done in the... I don't even know if I can even say this. <laughs> I didn't even take that way in there. 
the Rowan Centre in Antrim for sexual assault victims. She had one to her room and relive that all over again and tell that all over again on video. And we weren't allowed in with her. With that ignorant child protection officer. But thank God her intermediary was there. She was a lovely girl. So she came out of there and I said to him that day again, have you arrested him? Has he been charged? Is there bail conditions? There has to be something to not only protect our child, but other wee innocent kids on that side. No, I brought him in for interview, but I just denied everything and I spoke to his mum. I spoke to his mum. I said, so you didn't even ring him. You rung his mum. His mum. <laughs> So we, we left that day, and I mean, I cut off easily, drove the whole cut, and murdered him in the spot. I cut off, and so could my husband. There's no point in sitting here and saying any different. I mean, just let down, and let down, and let down. And that child had to relive that on numerous occasions, and he just could, his ma was wrong. Come on in, did you do this? And I'm like, no, that's all right, where you go, fuck all about it. This isn't acceptable. Not acceptable. Now that day, he, that child protection officer also told the child that she would never see him again, even though he wasn't prepared to arrest him. He wasn't prepared to put a bail condition on him, and he wasn't prepared to put a sexual harm risk prevention order on him. What he did say was that he was contacting his work and also the caravan park because that's that's where it happened and he was to be kept away he wasn't to be there and reassured the child you go and enjoy your wee holiday again you know don't you worry about it you will never see this guy again and I says can you guarantee me that my child or else will never set eyes on him other than in a court he says I promise you and I thought right a child protection officer has promised us that he won't be there so he rang me a couple of evenings later and said that yes, he had got speaking to that one witness that was down there. He had contacted the guy's work and he had also contacted the site owners, the caravan park owners, and he was to have no contact, he wasn't to be there. Well, what did they do? Well, disregarded it, let him come on ahead. Let him come on ahead. So it was a Friday evening, Friday the 16th, of June this year, I'll never forget it. Baller's Day weekend. Child was playing at my friend's caravan with her wee boy just a couple up from us. And I had walked over and I was standing chatting to her. And he drove past me and waved and smiled. And that's the hard bit. He actually drove past me. He was in his mother's car. So he was kidding enough not to bring his own car because his own car would have been seen. And he waved. And he smirked at me. And I thought, no. Fucking no. Absolutely fucking no. So I lifted the phone and I rang 101. And I said, you make it out here because this guy is here. What the police say? No, oh, because he's no... Bail conditions. You can't do anything about it. I says, my child protection officer promised us that he would not be here. There's other innocent children as well as my own. Now, if my child sees him, where's the trust against the police? You know, they have just promised my child she will never see him again to go to the caravan for us to come down and enjoy it. And there he is coming in and now you're telling me you can't do nothing about it. I says, you may get down here and do fucking something about it. I says, because there's going to be public outcry. It's, there's going to be public outcry. And he says, right, well, I'll come down. Or send someone down. So we, over the phone we arranged to meet at the front of the caravan park site. So I got my friend to <laughs> So that she didn't need to know that the police were coming and the whole upheaval. It didn't need to know that he was there. Didn't need to know anything. So we got her to watch <laughs> And we walked down to the front of the caravan park. Walked down there at the shop and in come the police. And... Uh, this, this leads on to a, a, another twist in the story. The same police officer that was there that I had rang the previous week knew the situation, knew what was going on. 
And uh, they went into the office. He says, oh, Laura, you know what you and blah, blah, blah. I says, right, we'll go in now here and speak with the owners. So me and my husband stood outside and was chatting to him while him, the other, his colleagues went in to speak to Stanley Walls and the owners of the site. And they weren't in two minutes, three minutes. <laughs> and I come, they come walking back out and he came over and he says to me, it's not good news. And I said, what do you mean it's not good news? He says, he wants you out. Me, what? What do you mean? Who wants you out? He said, Danny Wall says you, you have to leave. Me, what? Yeah, you have to leave. I says, no, I think you've got it wrong. This is, is, is there a mixed communication here somewhere? Like there's there's something, or have I missed something? Is it, what? Uh, my husband says, right, come on, into the office with the police. So me, two of the police officers, my husband into the office and there he's standing in the office and I said Stanley you've got this wrong I said well what are you are you seriously asking us to leave aye I want nothing to do with any of that I'll abuse nonsense <laughs> any of that I'll abuse nonsense he says whatever you wrote he says I'll give it back to you where you go pay this off so not only is that rotten human being allowed to be on the site and keep yes. coming to the site yes <coughs> you're getting kicked off. Yep. You, you're you're told here we don't want no not nonsense. Perpetrators allowed go. to stay. The victims had to go. Look, I'm sorry, Laura. I'm sorry. I've never struggled as much to hold something back in a podcast as I have now. I. What the fuck did you just go out there for? I'd have burnt the fucking place to the ground. Yeah. I I'm not. Look, I try not to judge, and I'm going to say this. There is nothing I would want mm-hmm. to do with any of it. Fuck walls. Yep. Fuck the caravan site. Yep. And fuck the caravan. Yep. I would not run the risk of my child seeing that person again. Yep. There's just no part of me that would have that. And yep. I, I don't give a fuck about arguing with them. I don't give a fuck about any of them. I'd kill that cunt and I'd burn the place to the ground. That's exactly and, how we felt. But what are you doing back down there? But we had only went down because we had to go there and we were assured that... We were assured that he was not going to be there. Well, why? Uh, why should the victim suffer more? Why should the victim be punished? But she, ha- she has suffered more. She's seen him. Yeah, but she wasn't supposed to. I, he wasn't I, I supposed to be there. She was look assured at all that the, he would Look wouldn't. at all the conversations you've had with these people. Mm-hmm. And I'm look, listen. I am sorry because you are a victim, and I'm not shouting at you. Mm-hmm. I, I just, I don't, I, I wouldn't, I, I struggle. Mm-hmm. I, I get angry, and there's a part of me there was like. Her seeing them again oh, here. could have been stopped. We that struggle with it as well. I wouldn't been arguing with this guy about staying. I wouldn't have wanted to fucking... See, the day he told me that he wanted nothing to do with the fact that... Say, as much as I yeah. want to protect everyone else, mm-hmm. fuck them. Yep. And I'm sorry. I can't see what you're doing back there. But Laura, what you were explaining was, if you were living in your home, so that was... You seen that caravan as being your home. That was your holiday home. That, that was, was our home. holiday home. That, yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You, if you were living in your home and your next door neighbour fuck I can't even explain I know what uh, you're you, trying you know what to I mean? say would if you move out of your house exactly yeah, if somebody next wouldn't. door done what they done you just wouldn't do would it would you move out of your house I don't know a lot of people will say yeah 100% I wouldn't but you're, you're in your view why should you move out of your home yep. and let somebody else mm-hmm. win yeah. Whenever they're the person wrong. That's no, it. No, look, listen, I'm sorry, guys. It's a fucking touring caravan. That cunt's still there. As as my under underlining thing is protection of my child. Mm-hmm. And that's why it's not your home. It's not about letting someone win. It's fuck all to do with letting someone win. You're being let down. And you are being mm-hmm. let down. Laura, Can I, I know you're... This uh, I'm sorry. I'm going to take a wee minute out here. I'm sorry. But that for me, I can't. So look, guys, some of you are listening, and uh, podcast a funny thing. It all comes back a funny thing. We just took a wee break there. I want to apologise because I get carried away and get angry and get invested, and I am wild man for shouting my opinion. I appreciate it. It's, it's no problem. I want you to know absolutely right now, categorically. Yeah, I am not judging in any way. Yes. I get angry and frustrated because I feel like I want to do something and this is You're how I'd be. And, and that isn't fair. 
and it's not a fair representation. You've come here today, and as hard for, as hard as this is to speak out mm-hmm. and and help and protect children. Yes, I. Who am I? Like just the slabber here, the thing. I, I just there's a part of me just gets carried away and be like, that's not what I do, and this is where I go. And, but it is and good to get that across because I have come face to face with that from from a ha- now, and I mean, I mean this. It's literally I could count them on the one hand. Every one out of the thousands and hundreds and thousands of messages, phone calls, knocks on the doors, on, on our door that I have received from from the general public has been absolutely amazing and supporting our family. Um, but uh, again, that handful of people you're always going to get, you know, the other side and and someone who's on the outside looking in and going, oh no, well this is my opinion. I wouldn't have went back. I wouldn't have done this. If we hadn't have went back. And if we hadn't have stood up, that just allows the preds or the perpetrators to continue doing what they're doing, to continue to let children be let down, to continue to let these guys who think that they're above the law to get off with it. And it's and it has to stop somewhere. It just it it this ca- this cannot be allowed to happen. But this isn't. This is actually bigger than we're talking about. This isn't a micro thing and and i don't want to say that and make it sound smaller these predators are out there yes and the reason we're here today is to show people how easy it is to be duped and Mm -hmm. till we had this conversation you you become trusting and i don't want to make people the most cynical people in the world but Mm -hmm. to some people you have to actually turn around and say you might think oh they're a nice person Mm -hmm. and we're saying men I just mean we've 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 yes. heard all sorts of stories. They're a nice person. A nice mm-hmm. person. Yeah. Don't care. I don't trust them, and I don't want everyone not to trust people. But we our trust has been broken, and yes. and we've listened to so many people with their trust being broken, mm-hmm. and then it leads us into like a nearly worse. The stories we've listened to, Sean, it makes us too yeah. vigilant, and yeah. it's tiresome because then you you're trusting nobody, and you can't take your eyes off your children. Mm-hmm. But to come back to this. And I want to boil it all down. There's been so many stages of letdown here. Oh, failures, massive failures. Massive failures. So, like, how did that make you feel? Like, you're, you're getting all these massive failures. The police didn't, they weren't doing what they were meant to do. No. They weren't meant to, they weren't doing. Protecting. They weren't yeah. protecting mm-hmm. the, your child and the other ch- kids that were on that site. And then, out of all that there, you're now being evicted from a campsite. Yeah. So, like, how did that make you feel? Victimized, um, publicly shamed in a sense. Um, the child punished for speaking for the family trying to do the right thing and protect further protect all their children. As I say, it, it wasn't just our own child; um, it was for all their children. Um, uh, it it just made us feel totally powerless. But then was was the situation that you were just told to pack up that day and see you later or how did how did yeah, it unfold? So whenever we went in, as I was saying, to the office that night with the police officers and we confronted him and personally ourselves after he had already told the, the policeman that we had to go and he said, No, nope, pack your stuff and go, that that's it. Now this was pushing ten o'clock at night. So he wasn't moving on it. That that was it. We were to go and that was it. And I says, Well look, it's this stage at night. The child needs to, you know, get to sleep. We'll go in the morning. No, you'll go tonight. Oh my god! So this guy doesn't sound like a nice person at all. Oh no, he um, as I say, judge, jury, executioner. That's 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 his side. It's his rules. You don't like them, out you go. So the and to be fair, the policeman that was that was one of one of the policemen that was standing in the office with us that time he says, "Mate, you're making a, a serious bad mistake here. Like this, these guys haven't done anything wrong. They're the victims. No, nope, get them out. That was it. Just get them out. No other conversation. No nothing. When he sat down." So the police came up with us to our caravan. I had to go and get a child from my friends. Um, we literally had to pack basic, what whatever we could, like her wee toys and, and whatever, and just a, a bag to, to go, just to leave and go home. And the police helped us. And I remember standing there and one of the, the another policeman that was standing there, um, he says, no, this isn't right. He says, I can back down to this office. And I says... I'm telling you now, before you get down, you're wasting your time because he's made his decision, that's it. And he says, no, I ain't going back down to this office. So down he went into the office and back up again. 
short time later and he says, no, you're right, there's no movement. He says, no, he's adamant, he's have to go. He says, look, mate, if you're buying anything else, like, and you're making the wrong decision, this is business suicide. What are you playing at? No, nah, get them out. Was it? They're bringing trouble to my door. Get them out. But he wasn't at a fucking leg on the view stood and says, no, you can fuck off. You need to get an eviction notice. And just put you off, like? Oh, he would have got the tractor up that he's done before with other people for far less and towed them off and left you at the front gate. Far less. Right. There's one thing I want to ask you, though. And the one thing, the whole thing was going through my head. When a child reports sexual assault, mm-hmm. the child doesn't attend court. No, no video link. No, I know. So it's not a pre-recorded video in a private room. It's it's a live. Yeah, so it is pre-recorded. So she, that that's okay. that's already been done for her statement purposes and video and whatever. So if it goes to court and they want to ask anything additional or, or question her or whatever, she won't be in the courtroom. Mm-hmm. You know, the child won't be in the courtroom. It will be in a separate room via video link. The again. reason the reason I'm bringing you back to that is I'm worried that if people listen to this think that they uh, their child will have to come and all and and, and it might scare them. Yeah. It, it's, it's no, the child system. won't be in the courtroom. Okay, that, no, no, because that that to me, I was like, that's fucking barbaric. Like, mm-hmm. it as a grown man to go into a courtroom, it'd be intimidating. That's scary, you know. So that that's well, I can only imagine. But I've never been, but uh, I can imagine. Scary enough. <laughs> 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 I, th- but that I, I actually just wanted to clarify that because it was like, mm-hmm. that's, you know, they they sound more like they're trying to dissuade you than persuade you. Yeah, and and and. and it just me. They wanted it all brushed under the carpet. When things like this, normally, what, what was the people's response like around the caravan that had heard this? What, 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 where were they? What was their? What was the feel? What was the general? Well, conversation around the park. We like, so we came home that night. We left at half ten, and our at half eleven we got home, got the child into bed, and as I said, I mean my husband sat down at the kitchen table and went, "What the fuck? What has just happened? Uh, is this real?" Are we here? Did this happen? He did tell us to go, didn't he? Yep, he did. So we've been victimised. What What do we do here? This is a, a private case with the police and investigation and whatever. He's now forced our hand. What do we do? You know, we've, we've been there doing everything in our power to protect children. And he has just put us out and let, let, let the perpetrator stay. No, this is wrong. So I did. I went onto Facebook and I put a post up. And I let people know exactly who was on the caravan park. No, I didn't name anyone. I just said. And this is where it leads into the, uh, another one. There is two suspected predators. Because on Easter Monday, it came, just Easter Monday of this year, it came to my attention as well from before that. And I want a clarification on those bail conditions. Before I, I like to have the evidence and everything before I act. So I got clarification from uh, Limavady Police Station of this guy's bail conditions. And I knew he had been there staying overnight on numerous occasions from the site opened at the at the start of the month, but until I had got confirmation of it, you can't you can't you can't just accuse someone. So I got clarification of his bail conditions and I rang the police to say that he was there as well. And um the police came and he was removed from the caravan park site and but he has now been remanded in custody for breaching his bail for upskirting whilst caravanning on the north coast. This is a separate, this yes. is a different guy? This is a different guy, yep. I can I can name one because it's in the newspaper. Uh, John Arnold, a school bus driver for primary school. What age is this, man? 40 oh, f- fuck. What, what does it matter what age you are? Actually, I don't know yep. why I even said that, but I just fucking pictured this. School bus driver. Right. And again, family friends of the caravan park owners knew that he was, and I have the evidence that they knew that he was appearing in court for X, Y, and Z, and still was allowed to stay in that caravan park. And so was his right. This is changing now. They mm-hmm. now are aware of two. Well, two. say allegations, yeah. right? Well, uh-huh. you have alleged, and they have now. He's been charged, but he hasn't been convicted. No, so, but he's remanded for breach and bail because right. I give the statement and he was removed and that's all. That. His bail conditions was to not be on the caravan side, is this correct? He wasn't allowed outside his home address to have mobile phone or internet connection, which obviously everything is in the caravan. Or interaction with children. Or children, yes. Obviously. So let me, let me uh, because I want to clarity on this, because this, this is... 
you must have got wind that this guy had done this because yes. you had witnessed him at the caravan park. Yes. So it, did you contact the police to say that he has breached these bill conditions that he shouldn't be here? Yes, it was actually the day in the Mavadi police station that my daughter went in to give her statement. And I asked her, would she... Or asked them would they tell me what his bail conditions were because I believe he is there and he is in breach of some kind of bail but I didn't have the proof so she gave me the proof that night and that's there's yeah. is that that's, that's nothing to do with that sir's law is it or there's there, if somebody's within the vicinity and you request if they have convictions something like that something like that I don't know actually but the ins and outs of that one so they it's weird. There are, I didn't know they're allowed to disclose bail conditions but if if they are in fact infringing on them in in which so this guy mm -hmm. has been arrested and charged and let's be honest, police find it so hard to prove these cases if they're charging them, they, they, they must have reason to believe. Mm -hmm. He has, are, are they, well he's an image, so he's a sexual, sexual predator they suspect. Mm -hmm. He is told not to be anywhere near children. Mm -hmm. So... I am assuming he that... He wasn't allowed to reside overnight outside But I'm assuming address. that some of these images then were not only adults, they were children. Oh, they were children. Right. So he's a pedophile, suspected pedophile. Yes. And a predator. And he's on the site with another pedophile predator. Yes. This is becoming... Uh, I think that they are aware of two sets of these and... Still mm -hmm. allowed them to come on the site. Still allowed them to be there. They were never once told, don't be here. You can't be here. Not in. Never once and the only reason told that to leave. This guy was remanded in custody was because you seen him first hand breaking his... Bail, bail conditions, yes. And I got the police out that night. The police actually came out the first time and said, went to the caravan to him and said, no, you have to go home. You're not allowed to be here, blah, blah, blah. And they came over to my car and said, look, we've removed him. And I says, well, why have you not arrested him? What for? I says, he breached his bail conditions. I didn't know he had bail conditions. Says, excuse me. I said, do you want to go and check? And I came back well, five minutes later. If you weren't aware of bail conditions, exactly. why would you remove him? Exactly. So they come back five minutes later and said, yeah, he has bail conditions. Will you give a statement to say that he's breached them? And I said, certainly. So you should have done your job first instead of me having to do it for you. I told you he was here breaching his bail conditions. So and he had to appear whatever day, the next day or a couple of days. I don't know the ins and outs of that, but he appeared and he was remanded. Aye, because any judge worth the salt that sees the evidence that the police has already in presented a park. <laughs> and then finds out that they're down in a family park aren't going to allow them bail again. No. Because they're going to say, you don't, you, you're going. Yeah, you're, you're going to keep, keep breaching your safe. bail. Mm -hmm. So there's there seems to be a pattern of, of and now let's be clear, we can't or like we've thrown a name of an owner out there. I don't know this person and uh we we may or may not put out a thing because we might not want anything to do with them. But now the only reason why I have named him is because they on the Sunday so we were told to leave on the Friday night, we returned on Saturday to take our caravan off and on the Sunday they released a statement. So that's what, why... What, what, what did they say in the statement? <laughs> they want to laugh. They threatened us with legal action. And anyone who likes, comments or shares with, with ourselves will be referred to the police also. So that's victim, inti victim intimidation also. Well, at first and foremost. Now, let's be clear of this. If mm -hmm. they feel that you have made a slander statement mm -hmm. and they're saying... That anyone else makes a slander statement about us, mm -hmm. we will take legal action and thing. They're perfectly entitled to do. Mm -hmm. But they stated that it was, uh, we were removed for making a baseless allegation. And here, out the paper, John Arnold. So was that included in the ongoing? Oh, yeah. To, to them, you became a troublemaker and you were making noise about yes. things that was happening, right? Mm -hmm. So They didn't want to be outed. Right. But... Is this a, like a closed community group, or have they made this a public post on their on their? It was on their Facebook page. Is it still on their Facebook page? No, they've removed it. Did they name you in the public statement? No. So they had wrote that if anyone shares fictitious or on baseless arguments on Facebook or social media or likes it and comments, it will be asked to leave the site or will be referred to. Did they say we'll be asked to leave the site? Did they threaten that? Uh, on the day that we took our caravan off, yes. 
So um, I obviously had, there was a community, and you've told people. Oh yeah, I told them, and I also there said was unrest that and the next day um, at two o'clock we will be arriving to take our caravan off. Anyone that wants to come out and support us, or you know, feel the needs that they want to ask further questions in relation to their own children, are they going to be guaranteed any safety? That these guys aren't going to be back, and bl- same thing as we went through at the start of the year, but we were tried to be brushed under the carpet. Um, so whenever we arrived down, oh, there was two, three hundred people. The the community did, you know, they 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 turned out and they were furious, like absolutely furious at their parents, their grandparents, their maybe some that didn't have parents, but still maybe had their friends coming down with it. Just a caravan park scenario. Um, and my husband, he was up at the caravan, um, you know, taking the wheel lock off and whatever, and get getting a towed and. We had to get a friend to um, tow it home for us because our caravan was there seasonal. We had no need for even a tow bar, you know, so we had never moved it. It was there. So we had to get mm. a friend to, to tow it off for us. And um, I was down at the office with the police and I kept saying to the police, you know, like, there's bound to be something you guys can do. This is not right. No, this is civil. We can't do nothing about it. It's a civil case. What were they doing there then if it was civil? You tell me. No one knows Because the if there's no breach of peace. No. No. The, the, what, are they facilitating for him? Were they facilitating for you? Had you contacted them? Had they? No, nope, I didn't contact them. So they, the site on, owners have obviously contacted them because it didn't come from us. Because they're worried of unrest mm-hmm. or a confrontation. Which, to be honest with you, well, the, fair the, play the, to them. The, that's can, that's fine. They're they they're, they're entitled to, to do that. I, and look, right, they're handling the the whole thing about this is, the, and this to me. You had three witnesses, and they're saying you had a baseless allegation. As 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 people making this, you know, like what yeah. is, what is, what would be the motive for anybody? Mm-hmm. You know, anyone with logic listening to this now hears that three other people, child's come forward. Mm-hmm. You've said this. You you don't you don't stand again anything from from this. This is just turmoil that you're opening up till now. Yeah. So anybody slightly logic would. I always tend to look at motivation. What would motivate anybody to do that? There's no motivation there. So them to turn around and say baseless. Now, the one thing we have to be careful of too, if the police haven't charged this person, mm-hmm. right, and they haven't charged this person, mm-hmm. to all intents and purposes, the, the caravan owner could turn around and say, they haven't been charged, they've told me, mm-hmm. I believe it. And, and I'm playing devil's mm-hmm. advocate here because... Yeah. Uh, Look, we need we need to see all sides of yeah. it, and that's that's the purpose of being here today. Because there's too many, I suppose, uh, because it's so public. But there's still unanswered questions from people that want but to know. The point that I see is he doesn't have an employment contract. He's a volunteer. Yeah. yeah. To tell someone not to come back will not. If you told someone not to come back that was employed by you, and they then haven't you're been in the charged, whole legal and, thing, and yeah. you think you could be in a serious position, yeah. but. To tell somebody that they're not allowed in the site when they don't, they're not employed directly by you, yeah. it really does to me baffles. You know, did they just was there a free worker? Why, why would you work for free? You know, there's going to be pay. Like mm-hmm. th- these, are, these are all money making sites. Yeah, big money. Ground keepers and all are all paid, and they advertise for staff. Like mm-hmm. you know, it, it it the motivation to volunteer mm-hmm. to work there. Just, I'm going to say, I know who I believe in it. Mm-hmm. And uh, the police haven't done anything. The, what what was the ombudsman then? Well, then you were obviously then. Yeah, so the build up to the ombudsman was, so we removed our caravan on the Saturday. And on the Sunday then they issued their statement on their Facebook page, threatening us with legal action for further speaking out and saying it was baseless and even though we've all the evidence and, and everything there and, and that's fine look that, that that's up to them which is disgusting to threaten a mother or any victim of sexual abuse with legal action for a start is it's just the unthinkable you just you just wouldn't but um on the monday i emailed sorry i tried to ring first of all sent uh, a few phone calls unanswered text messages and numerous emails to that child protection officer that we had at the time and for seven weeks we had no response nothing for seven weeks we tried to get our child protection officer to say we are in handling here this this is what's happened you know 
what, 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 what can we do? How can you help us? Can we have a family liaison officer from the PSNA? Can we have someone to issue a statement? Can we have something? You know, because we're getting this from all angles and directions and uh, forms here at the minute, and this is this is scandalous. Like, um, seven weeks, no, no, no reply. And uh, I said, my husband says, "No, fuck us, ombudsman, ombudsman." Put the put the complaint in to say about um, I'm not being initially arrested and charged, and about the no contact um, from the child protection officer and various other. Just the fucking shit show, aye? Aye, all the feelings. The uh, crap that we had been up against. And, you know, you, could, you approach these people and, or these authorities in the PSNA for help, you know, and for to do the right thing and to follow procedures. And that's that's what we've ended up getting. But anyway, we went to the ombudsman, lodged the complaint, and um, still we're waiting to hear back. And the phone went. Um, you'd mm. sent all over the ombudsman. Did you receive a, a response from the ombudsman? We received a response from the ombudsman to say that they could do it two ways, the formal or the informal, first of all, or the formal rate. He said, if you go the informal rate, you will, it'll be passed on to like an inspector and see if we can resolve it that way. And um, Nearly see, the first port. The first port of oh. call, basically, covering all bases first. And if you're still not happy, look, you're 100% come back to us and we'll go the formal rate then. And we haven't done had, what do we do? Do we just go straight formal or do we try informal first? And I thought, well, if we're getting an inspector, surely to God, yeah. he's going to, or she's going to, or however it was going to be, is going to see this isn't fucking right here. Like. So we decided, right, well, we'll give the informal rate a bash first. So they gave me the, went back to the ombudsman, said, yes, we'll go to the informal rate. And they said that it would be a few weeks' time that an inspector would be in touch. So fast forward a few weeks and we still hadn't heard from our old or from our child protection officer at that time. And just by absolute chance, one day, and and it actually worked out two days before the inspector got in touch with us. And it was two days before that. And I says, I'm going to try him one last time to see if I can get a hold of this man. And I rang and he answered. And I said, hello. And he says, what is it you want to know now? What? Uh-huh. I said, his name? I said, look, all we are looking for is an update. I says, I have tried to call you numerous times. We have sent numerous communication via text message and email. We've had no response. How do you have holidays to take? And I says, well, I understand that and I respect that and, and that's fine. I says, but all I'm looking for is, you know, an update. I says, since you've been on your holidays, we have been evicted from Stay at Caravan site and, and our case is now public and everything that went with it and he started to like talk over the top of me and I said look hang on a wee minute with all due respect all I want is an update I don't appreciate being shouted at down the phone and I was cool and calm and collective and I thought what kind of response is that from a child protection officer so my husband had heard it and he took the phone off me and he said hello and he said his name and he said um look mate to tell you what it is all we're looking for is a wee update and he started shouting at him and then hung up So I lifted the phone and I went straight back to the ombudsman and I says, can you give me the direct line number for that inspector that is going to be calling me because I am going to call him first or her. I didn't know at that stage who it was, if it was a him or a her. And yep, they gave me the, the extension number, the contact details, and I got on to that inspector. And that, he sat and listened to me. It was a man. He sat and listened to me for a good hour, maybe an hour and a half on that phone. And you could even hear in his silence he was like, what? He he was, you, you could hear the shock and the silence. You could hear the, oh my God, what, what, how am I going to fix this? This is a royal mess. You have been let down. You have been failed so many times. What can we do to fix this? And he said, look, I'm going to review everything and I'll ring you back tomorrow. And he did. He rang me back the next day and straight away that child protection officer was took off our case and we were assigned another one. And the one that we have at the minute now, to be fair, is fantastic. And we're getting updates and we're getting... Like, even up until that, one of our witnesses weren't even interviewed. We hadn't even bothered his ass to do that. I can't... Oh, my God. No. Just two, so sorry. He'd only interviewed one, two. The other two haven't, they, haven't even been interviewed. And he bothered his arse to do that. I would... I'm not a legal professional. Mm -hmm. But I would assume that three witness statements... You would want to get them straight away, wouldn't you? Because the 
not that they change. People mm. forget things. So yeah. it's obviously, if somebody makes a serious allegation like that, the first thing you want to do is corroborate. Yeah. So if you have a victim comes forward and three people, which is pretty powerful, compelling evidence, mm -hmm. you know, the fact that you've had to fight and argue and, and it's just, but I'm worried too. Or I'm worried people will listen to this. It's so hard to have the courage that he's had to go to the police. Mm -hmm. It's so hard. It could be so easy to say that awful things happen. We're going to cure for our child and we're, we're, we're going to turn away and bury yeah. our head in the sand. And, and, yeah. and, and, and a lot would completely understand. And a lot have. A lot yes. of people have found out their child's been victim and they just, they don't want any more of, of, the trauma or the thing and look total respect to them there is no judgment on uh, my on I, my behalf for them if that's how they but i think you're right i yeah. i think that there's an onus sometimes that these people need to be held accountable they to do. stop it happening to somebody else and that is why i have said and numerous people again not numerous again on that one hand that i can count has came and said why the fuck did you go back and i'm going if I hadn't have went back, number one, my child is first and foremost in my life, always will be, and that is never going to change. She was, uh, uh, the caravan was for her, you know, as, mu as much as us on, on the weekends. The caravan initially, my first thought of getting mum was for the child, for the creating happy memories. We went down there, yes, it's a towing caravan, we could have towed that off at any stage, but why should we and my child be further punished victimised everything and let the preds stay let the perpetrators stay bury it brush it under the carpet that's what's wrong in northern ireland people are afraid to speak people are afraid to stand their ground it's what easy should? to go it's easy to take your money and run it's easy to brush it under the carpet and look no disrespect to anyone at all for you know not speaking or anything everyone is different but for me that night when I stood in that office with those two officers and Stanley Wall stood in front of me and my husband and that policeman or them police men, or police officers. Do you know what? It was that much of a blur. There could have been officers, men and women. I can't even remember. Something inside me ignited. Something just switched. Something changed. And as I said before, I am normally a cool and collective and a calm and a rational I would think about things I'm I'm always two steps ahead whereas my husband he just acts and then thinks and I go Jesus no you can't do that you have to think about what repercussions your actions have so I so again on that Friday night when we come home and sat at our kitchen table we had two choices we could either take the money brush it under the carpet say nothing deal with our case privately and hope for a conviction or we could further protect children we could highlight a serious, serious safeguarding issue. We could let parents aware. We could make a stand for not only our own child, but for other parents and other children to say, do not be afraid. Do not be scared. Do not let bully boy tactics overrule any abuse. Don't be scared. Yes, we lost our caravan site. What is it? It's material possessions. I wasn't born with silver spoon in my mouth. I couldn't give a damn about money. I never had it. Probably never will. It's Money doesn't rule me. My heart and my family does. A caravan, material possessions again. That means nothing to me. But what did was my child. And everything that we did in this situation was for our child and to further protect other children. Now, I could not have left there or not went back and stayed at home and put my head in a pillow at night thinking, yeah, Laura, you done the right thing. Because I would always, always, always take it to my grave that I did not do anything to protect those children. And that is why we returned. That is why, again, with, with the, you know, the child consent that she initially wanted to go down. And in a way, it worked out that that was her time to speak. That was her time that she wanted to report. You know, but it, it, was, all, it was all for her. But you... you you see, this is what I'm worried about. You, you, you had the courage to stand up and go yes. to the police. And I'm saying, if people are there, don't be afraid to go to them. They won't. The, the horrific handling of yours yeah. isn't the way it's always been. No. Nope. And I'm just, I'm, I'm slightly worried that people listen and go, "Fuck, is this if the If we handling? go and is report, this is handling? this going to happen? And no, this <clears> just <throat> seems like a really, really bad 
case handling mm-hmm. and it's got so intricate and messy and the the fact the underlying fact to me is there's three people have witnessed mm-hmm. there's a victim statement mm-hmm. and this person's never been lifted yeah and still not to this day and that will forever what the fuck actually has me. to happen you what, tell me what the fuck actually has to happen like they, the police be on all the time saying come forward and we we'll look after you and blah and this is a way to this is what I'm worried about I it, know it, what you're going to say that, I, that people should you're, and you're right I, to protect people you know stay inside we're not going to protect people but another one will have had this absolute no. horrible handling mm-hmm. so we're, we're not saying to people don't come forward because nope, this is, you won't be trusted or you won't be nope. safe but this just seems like a fuck up uh, this is a royal fuck up. This is a total fuck up. And what what what's the plan now? What what so did you get you paid back your fees for the remaining part of the year? Did they were they refunded back to you and that was you were no longer a part of the site or or what was the what was the what's the next what's happened then? So on the Friday night when he told us to leave, he said that he would any money paid to date that he would give back. So at that stage, I hadn't put it on Facebook. I hadn't. Um, told people to come and support me that we were leaving. You know, he had made that decision because he thought then I was going to take my money, shut my mouth. I was only a wee country girl and away I went. Bob's your uncle, job done. That was it, over and done with, forgot about. No, not this mommy. I thought, no, money doesn't buy that. <laughs> Definitely not. I will not be quiet. He did not expect um, us, us, us to go as far as we have with it and, and highlight such a serious issue. So on the Saturday then, as I say, the next day we went down to take our caravan off and um, my husband went into the office with the police officers. He uh, he asked the police to come in with him, you know, so it, he couldn't say this or he couldn't say that. They had witnesses to, to him being in the office as well. And uh, he went into the office and says, I'm here to get my money back. Uh, oh, no, 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 that's not the way of it. And the, the policeman actually says, I it was because I was here last night when you told the family that you were going to give them a back. So he handed every, all the money back in cash. And in a statement that he's put out that we got it back as a goodwill gesture. <laughs> now, if we were evicted from that caravan park for bringing trouble to his door or causing trouble why would and he? staying for months, why would we get our money back? Have you ever been anywhere, caused trouble and got your money back in your ear and you're like, no. What, have Without you it? heard anything from the community since then? Yes. And what has been the 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 masses has been put out? Or uh, what they're uh, or what the, what they post and what they're saying is obviously what is it they're saying that you this just made been, this up and that No, this is uh since our story our in the last two months from, from this has came out, um we are hearing a lot of this isn't the first time this has happened. Um It always seems to be the way somebody speaks up. All of a sudden, the out. whispers of mm-hmm. this happened, that happened. We've seen it in mm-hmm. Hollywood and things like that. The money's by. The mm-hmm. police, if they haven't done nothing now, no. I don't see them doing nothing. My one worry is for anybody that's thinking about, and this isn't me trying to, to, to destroy a business, that's thinking about this industry. There's certain industries that I've said to other people, and I want to put it on here now. There's industries that need... To have the same regulation as teachers. 100%. Football coaches, scouts, fun fairs, mm-hmm. uh, holiday parks, where people put themselves in the... And we have known that predators source these places out mm-hmm. to put themselves in the position where they're of trust yes, and they're left alone with children. But also anyone in the like of that position that is working around children, even they're not directly working with them like in a... A youth club or something, but obviously they're there. They're cleaning toilets. They're they're within the caravan community where there is obviously a lot of children. They should each and every worker, whether they're volunteer or not, should be police charged. Yes, one hundred percent. They should, they be. should be all subject to uh, be. a police charge. Yes, and that's what I'm saying. The, these mm-hmm. industries where they seem to float under the radar <coughs> have allowed. We've seen it now. We're starting to see it now, and also religious orders, different mm-hmm. things. The these things. We cannot be, unless, 
Let's be very genuine now. There is yeah. a lot of good people out here. Oh, hundred so percent. So I threw a lot of things out there. I've been coached for rugby through my life, mm-hmm. and and genuine. There's there's a lot of good people here, and we're not on doing that. But the good people won't care about getting checked. No. The only people that's ever going to worry about Someday getting checked. But you know, I'm going to tell you now. That's not going to be done. That's not going to be done, and I'm going to tell you why. We're in a country with a government, and I'm going to say it, and I don't give a shit. We'll probably have to take it out for legal reasons. Full of nonsense. They're protecting nonsense. Mm-hmm. They don't care. They're making laws. They're they're lowering the sexual age of consent to fourteen. They're actively That's trying corrupt. to do that, and they 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 don't talk about certain things and they don't get involved in. For the simple reason is, half them were involved with Savile and all this shit because yes. they're fucking nonsense and they won't change laws to protect. And it's only through actions like the the serpian, the campaign from my mother. To, to bring about Sarah's law, things like that, to feel safe, to protect our children. Yes. And in, in like, we're hearing that, and I don't want to scare, I, you know, I take my children up to camera, I don't want to scare yeah. people, but I do want people to be absolutely vigilant. Extra vigilant. And even that person that you think you trusted. Extra vigilant, up. and then more vigilant, and then another wee bit. But it corrupts us a bit. We're not, the care, we're not the trusting people, and that, that's why I actually am. I actually said this to you that I'm happy that I'm, I'm happy that to be wrong, mm-hmm. but know that I'm always been right. Yes. And hindsight, we can't have. You can't. You can only do now, and you're doing now the right thing. You're doing what you you, you, you think. We can't be. You can't like we could all second guess decisions we made and where what has happened. Yes. It can't be like that. You've done the th- the right thing, and if people are there and they're weighing up whether they should come forward, even though the police fucked this completely royally, and I don't know how, we need people to come forward because if there's other people that have yes. had that experience there, one hundred percent, and if it's the other side, it's protecting the children. And you know something, Th- that that guy's being watched now by all them parts. But also let it be known that our the fuck up with us. And with, with our case, let that be a lesson to child protection officers, to the PSNI, to the relevant authorities, to not ever let, allow this to happen again with another victim, another family, another case. Let this be a learning curve. Let this be a put the right person in the right job case. One hundred percent. Because do you understand? If you're a child protection officer and you answer the phone to the parent of a child that's been abused with yes, what you want attitude. now, you take a wee look at yourself. And then hang the phone up Readjust your them. career and get a move. From no contact because for seven weeks. You're not in there. When we were in serious need of someone there to help and support us. And do exactly what it says in your top, protect our children. Correct. It, and that has been my driving force since. And again, going back to why did you go back? It says it on the top. Protect our children. If... If Someone had to be there to do it. What the owners weren't going to do it. What point are you at now? So you you have new child protection officer yes. looking after the case. Mm-hmm. So has it moved any further forward? Have they interviewed the, the, our witnesses yet? Yes. Right. The new one has. Is this r- recent? Recent. Right, so they have actually, with a new person, have decided to start. So they have Which should have been done from the start. Oh, 100%. Mm-hmm. But what I mean is, I, I was worried that they... St- a new person but still don't give a fuck and they haven't done anything oh no so there's been a progression in the fact that right okay okay which i wholeheartedly wish that we had have got at the very start you know we weren't shown any (sighs) compassion yeah i think that's the correct word to use um i because we we we've seen how hard it is for victims to come forward yes and we see police breaking down day after day when they just the person changes their mind and, mm. and they're, they're so close and, they, and you know they want to get these people. Yes. They did not take this job mm-hmm. not to convict these people. Mm-hmm. I know we give the police a lot of abuse but the people that have done that job Oh look here, there is they, fantastic officers they there. They want the ambassadors away. Yeah. And this is the and, and the genuine ones will be hurting to hear this but mm-hmm. I would say and we would have to ask this and we will probably have to email across the place because I do, I want to know how. Mm-hmm. A victim's come forward. Three people have come forward for a witness yes. statement. You didn't take 
two of the witness statements. You haven't acted on any of the information. And, and you no know this made. person is in the position to offend time and time again. If you've been made aware of this, and people will lose their jobs over this. If you were aware of this last year, mm-hmm. and something happens now, it's fucking on them. It's yes. on the people and the misgivings and the people in the power to do something. That's another reason why we didn't run happening. away. Keep it, your feet in the ground and there's there's a lot of I, there's a lot of things that would angry and a mm-hmm. lot of hurdles that I'm sure you still to come and then you've had the social media aspect of it and you've had yeah. this and and it it'll it'll this will hopefully hopefully reignite this again. Yeah. Um, the people in the community I feel a bit for them because it says a lot of static ones. Yes, and they're signed in. Mm-hmm. They spent a lot of money for the caravan. They're stuck. If they were to take it away, they would lose thousands upon oh, thousands they get of pounds. Buttons for it. Um, some of the contracts would be they couldn't even take it to summer because it's too old now, and the new places won't take it. Yes. So, like, it's easy to say why well, don't everyone leave? It's not 100%. as easy as that. And look, it, I really do feel for parents and or anyone down there that feels that they're in that position because it's it's not it's not easy to just get up and go. And we look. Our situation is confirmation of it, and we were only a touring caravan, and that was not because of money or because of anything. That was simply to protect children. And I can understand people thinking, why the fuck did you not, or why the fuck did you go back? Why did you, you know, do all that? Again, it comes down to, if we didn't make a stand, who was going to? Who was going to stand there and protect children to make sure that the right thing was done? The owners certainly weren't doing it. They've proved that. No one else was willing to speak. Do you know what I mean? But what I also don't want is anyone out there, and my heart goes out to them, but anyone out there who has been subject to any kind of abuse, whether it be there, be anywhere, do not let our our feelings or the, the PSNI's feelings with our case cloud that because I want this to go public now further. And that's why I've came here today is to highlight this. And I want it to be a lesson to caravan side owners. I want it to be a lesson to child protection officers, to the PSNA, to the wider community. Look what has happened to this family. Look what they have done. You, t- you open the PSNA openly say, come to us, come report, come do. Look what we did on numerous occasions. Look at the feelings we had. Look at the response we got from a said child protection officer. And the no response for seven weeks just left in limbo land. Even that day that we were evicted on the Saturday, there was, oh God, I don't know how many police car loads down there which the site owners had obviously called, and rightly so. They, they had every every um, reason to, not reason to, but that every, I suppose they didn't want conflict or I'm anything gonna, kicking off. Let's be honest, they're a sharp cunt, so I don't give a fuck. Yeah, but the most they, ignorant, they, vile people. They 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 think they're above, and I, we know, even by you explaining to me, I know the very type of the person. Mm-hmm. But I will tell you something here now. If they are any way aware of something, and something happens, it's on your fucking head. But that's you're, what I had said. If you're a facilitator, remember I asked you this, Sean, one time, is we were talking about the bishop and the priest. Who the perpetrator. is worse? The perpetrator or the facilitator? They're hand in hand. And if you're aware of that, and you're burying your head in the sand, or you're denying it, and you have any sort of inclination, and you're allowing that person to continue in a place of children, fucking shame on you. And shame on you, and and your karma, 100%. and everything that will come to you will come to you. I want to thank you for coming up. I want to apologize if you think that I was trying to like pass through because I'm not, and I'm and, and I'm not, and I, and I never want to be in the position. And that's just been on. I never want. To be I wouldn't in the wish it on my worst enemy. Where where I think, and everyone, nobody's walked your shoes. No, and until they have, the reserve. I'll have to go and learn from this. Yes. Uh, there's parts of me that's charged and, and invested, and, and, and it is. And I am glad you came. And I hope you. the message comes out. And I really am glad you come. And I, I'm sorry if <laughs> I got a bit heated, but it. Uh, no, but I think that had to happen because we're all human. You're a father. You know, even from a male perspective to a female perspective, w- women are a wee bit more. Correct me if I'm wrong, but. You know, the logical thinkers, whereas men and, and fathers just act and then think. Um, maybe I'm wrong in saying that. That's just my own personal view and opinion on it. But it's in hindsight, 
and now after the after the wee heated bit on that topic, I'm glad that it did happen because it had to be. It had uh, the question had to be asked, and I had to be here to answer it, and I'm happy to answer it. Now, whether my answer satisfies everyone, that that's that that's their opinion as well. And look, no judgment on me for for any of it, but they haven't walked in my shoes. They haven't put their head on my pillow at night. They haven't listened to my child cry. They haven't been to these appointments. They haven't had to deal with our situation. They haven't had to... Um, wipe my tears. Broke. Yeah. Hmm. You know, and, and as I said right back at the start that Sunday morning, my heart and our hearts, my, myself and my husband, smashed in a, not even a million, billion pieces. And there's fragments of that heart scattered and I will never get those back. Never. Never. Well, well I just hope for you and your, your husband and I hope you just get some sort of justice. Yeah. yeah. See, after yeah. all these feelings has happened. I will this fight for it. I will not stop. Yeah. I well, will not stop. You know what? If the fucking police, I hope this exposes them constant people will be commenting below and people will be aware and when people are shopping about, I would say be very, very cautious. Of why you decide to choose. Do you see the Saturday, just to, to touch on that one as well, the Saturday whenever we were taking our carbon off and I was outside the, the office and people were all starting out, you know, wanting answers. and uh, The wife came out with a video camera and they were shouting, you know, like, can you guarantee that our kids are going to be safe? Are they here? Will they be allowed back? Blah, blah, blah. There was all sorts flying at him or at her. And she shouted, if you all don't like it, take your caravans and go. If that is the level there, I would question anybody that wants to part with money then. But look, thank you very much, Laura. It was great to see you to come here and say that story out. Um, and uh, let's hope it helps. Thank no. you. No, thank you very much. It was thank a you pleasure. very much, Laura. No problem. Thank you.